Could everyone please have a seat? We're going to start the meeting soon. Could you folks please come in and close the door? I like the hat. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to get started. Please take your seats. We're going to be starting soon. Is, is my mic not on? <laughs> You're just like built for it. Right. Good evening, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? We're now going to begin the Bellingham City Council meeting of December 4th, 2017. I'd like to call this meeting to order and first make some announcements. Uh, the first announcement is that the City Council's annual reorganization meeting will take place on January 8th with discussion at 1 p.m. In, in the Mayor's boardroom and then a swearing-in ceremony of new elected City Council members at 7 p.m. in Council Chambers that evening, January 8th. Would you all please uh, stand and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. April Barker? Here. Dan Hamill? Here. Jane Knudsen? Here. Michael Lelequist? Here. Roxanne Murphy? Here. Pinky Vargas? Here. Terry Borneman? Here. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, before we begin tonight, I'd like to ask people if they would to join me in a moment of silence. There were two members of our community who were um, long-standing public servants and known and loved by many people who died recently. Uh, one of those is Tanya Rowe, and she worked for the uh, school district. And then for over 20 years, Byron Elmendorf was the director of our parks department. And Gene, would I say some words about Byron? You knew him well. Yes, Byron Elmendorf was one of our first park directors, and he was park director for 23 years. Uh, he passed away unexpectedly in Hawaii a couple of weeks ago. Byron was one of the best public servants we ever had. He had a different way of doing things, but the bottom line for Byron was he did what was best for this community. You might not have agreed with him, but he did everything he could to protect this city. And I just want to send out our condolences to Becky, Ty, and Amy. He will not only be missed as a veteran of City Hall, but he's going to be missed as a distinguished citizen of this city, too. So for the family and friends of Tanya and Byron, please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. So this evening, let me tell you how it's going to go. First thing we're going to have is a special presentation, the introduction of David Dahl as our new chief of police. Then we'll go into a public hearing. That public hearing um, will go on as long as we need to take comments for it. And after the public hearing is closed, we will then begin our 15-minute public comment period set aside for public speakers. And then we'll go into our uh, committee reports. So first of all, presentation of the new chief of police, Mayor Kelly. It is my pleasure, even though it seems a bit anticlimactic because he's already made a presentation to the Committee <laughs> of the Whole, but um, to introduce, I, I'm pleased to introduce our new police chief, David Dahl. David was a candidate five years ago, and uh, he took advantage of having an experienced, accomplished police chief to mentor him through the system, and so this time when uh, it was time to pick a new chief, uh, it wasn't difficult. So I am very happy that David said yes, that he wants to spend his whole career here in our city. And um, I think he'll do a great job of carrying on the legacy of Chief Cook and the community policing model that we wanted to implement. So thank you very much, David, for saying yes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, last Friday, I had the opportunity at the police academy in Seattle to give a diploma to one of our newest police officers Sean Nelson. And I, I remembered then uh, what it was like to get that diploma and to graduate from the academy. And then I realized that was 34 years ago. Um, I started in this department when I was 17 years of age as an explorer cadet. And quite frankly, this is my family. I am, I am so honored to lead such a tremendous group of women and men who are our police officers. Um, they show such compassion 
and, and empathetic enforcement to all of our communities. I, in fact, just today I received an email from the mayor's office on two of our officers uh, that they were helping uh, a man who appeared to be in great distress. Uh, he was shirtless, if you could imagine that, this early in the morning, but they spent so much time with him and just calming him down, and citizens saw that and had the presence of mind to just be so impressed with that that they wrote an email to, uh, to Mayor Linville's office. Um, I'm very honored. I uh, spent all my adult life with this organization, and I intend to spend a few more years as your police chief. So, Mayor Kelly, thank you for choosing me. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, you're welcome very much, Chief Dahl. If you'd like to go meet our council members. Anyway, thank you very much for taking time for me to introduce David and give him the um, encouragement and acknowledgement that he, I believe, he richly deserves. Okay, thank you, Mayor Kelly. We'll now go to the public hearing. It's a public hearing regarding an ordinance adopting protections for residential tenants. This came, comes forward out of a series of committee meetings uh, in the planning department. Uh, following several committee meetings uh, regarding the challenges that are face especially lower income residential tenants, the Bellingham City Council directed staff to prepare a draft ordinance which would prohibit source of income discrimination. It would increase the notice period for substantial rent increases and it would increase the notice required prior to no fault evictions. Uh, the ordinance was attached in our packet and will there be a presentation, Mr. Sepler? Ah, Mr. Rufato. All right, Peter Rufato, City Attorney's Office. So um, as you noted, uh, you have in the packet just to identify the elements. You have the ordinance. You have a, a one-page memo that highlights the key elements. Uh, you have uh, some question and answers from the Housing Authority and you have some public comments. So I just wanted to make sure it's clear what you have in the packet before you. As far as background for this ordinance, as you all know, there were several meetings at the planning committee level, um, and there were uh, discussions with uh, folks from industry groups as well as advocates, and, uh, and what came out, came out of that was direction to prepare an ordinance. Um, what I'd like to do is just walk through the basic elements of the ordinance so that that's clear. Um, starting out with the whereas clauses, uh, it basically just in a nutshell, they lay out the policy basis for the ordinance, which um, if I were to boil it down, a very tight residential market with very low uh, vacancy rates, along with an identified need to protect low income uh, tenants and prospective tenants from displacement. Moving on to the substantive provisions, as far as source of income discrimination, you'll find that um, this only applies to residential uh, tenancies. It does apply to mobile home lots. The source of income definition is very broad, so you have not only Section 8 vouchers, but you have other types of subsidy programs, whether that's veterans or, or any other type of subsidy. The heart of the uh, ordinance on this particular element provides that no, sh no person shall refuse to rent a rental unit to any rental applicant on the basis that the applicant proposes to rent such unit with a source of income as defined in this chapter. It is noted in the ordinance that uh, other screening criteria can still be used so long as they are, so long as they are consistent with other laws. And it also provides that no person shall advertise in a way that would suggest an indication to discriminate against um, a source of income. There are a couple exceptions. Um, first of all, nothing in this chapter will apply to basically someone who is renting out one of a room, a homeowner who's renting out a room in their in their unit will not be subject to this ordinance as currently written. And it also identifies uh, that if there are other reasons that that unit does not fit within, like for example, the Section 8 program or whatever applicable subsidy program it is, um, it, it, won't, uh, it won't apply. Now, 
it does say that the ordinance provides that a refusal to allow an inspection would not allow you to come within that exception. In terms of enforcement, we have both the city administrative enforcement, currently um, that's identified as a $500 civil infraction, but we also have a private right of action which would allow a tenant either uh, on their own or with the assistance of potentially an advocacy group to um, bring a legal action in court to enforce the ordinance. Moving on to the next uh, element of the ordinance, and that is uh, an increased notice for substantial rent increases. Uh, the notice period uh, is increased to 60 days, and that is for any increase, uh, any anticipated increase by 10% or more over the periodic or rental rate charged the same tenant for the same housing over the previous 12 month period. The same exception is written for that provision. Uh, in other words, someone who's sublet, subletting a, a unit within their home. And then the third and final element is a increase from 20 days to 60 days for termination of, of tenancy. Uh, a no-fault termination, that is, and um, just one of the things right now, I will talk about some of the issues that have been raised. I think it's helpful, both in the previous council meeting and some of those that I've picked up in the last week or so from the written comment. But um, I, I agree with the letter written uh, by the industry group that, that that should be not eviction notice, but a, a termination notice. So I agree with that, and that, I think that comes up in a couple places. Um, with respect to enforcement on the <clears throat> increased notice to 60 days in this category, it basically creates an affirmative defense uh, for an eviction process. And again, this is only for no cause uh, evictions if you have a uh, fair to pay rent or some other uh, type of uh, eviction for cause, this would not apply. In terms of, uh, those are the basic elements. Uh, one of the issues uh, that was raised at the last uh, council meeting or the last time we talked about this was the time it takes for an inspection. Um, and uh, I met with the Housing Authority folks and they identified, and that's actually in the packet in their Q&A, that it's about a seven to ten day uh, time it takes to get an inspection done. Uh, council Member Hamill asked a question about a mitigation fund and whether so there is, it's, it hasn't been used much, but there was a provision in state law that basically said if you have uh, a source of income discrimination ordinance on the books, landlords can, if they have a judgment against the tenant, access that fund for payment. I don't want to overstate the nature of this. We don't know that much about it, but Mark Gardner did some looking into it, and that fund has been accessed. Uh, not a lot, but it has been accessed. And to answer the question posed at that meeting, this ordinance would satisfy um, that uh, provision. So we would fall within that here in Bellingham. Another item that was identified was the civil penalty. It's not changed here, but you could, for a second, if you wanted to have an um, increasing civil infraction, you could increase that to 750 for the second, uh, the second infraction, if proven. And then more recently, um, well, there was also a question about service of process. I agree that that should be changed too. So when we talk about the 20 day notice, I think it references the wrong RCW. I think we should reference the same um, process that, use, that is currently used for the 20 day notice. And then we recently had um, a note from Steve Powers, Catholic Community Services. I just want to note something we have to think about. And that is that Catholic Community Services um, often uses a 20-day no-fault notice in place of a for-cause notice uh, because they don't want that negative mark to be um, to blemish the tenant's record. So we have to think about the potential unintended consequence. So the way they're reading it, and and I think the way Steve was reading it, they would have to give a 60-day notice uh, even when they have what they call a, they're basically giving someone a 20 day notice and they're not saying it's for failure to pay rent or some other breach of the contract. So um, I don't know if I'm being totally clear, but they're trying to give that person a little extra time and keep that off, the rec off their record. And so we want to think about that. And all these things we can, we can huddle 
um, at some point as staff and address if appropriate. So um, I believe that's all I have, unless there are any questions. Council members, any questions before we start the hearing? Pinky? I, I just had a quick question, Peter. In regards to access to mitigation funds, can you tell me where that was in the ordinance? I didn't see that particular statement somewhere. Yeah, you won't find that in the ordinance because that is a state law that allows um, uh, landlords to access that fund if the jurisdiction um, that applies has a uh, source of income, a no, a no discrimination against source of income ordinance on the books. So we don't have to guarantee that, but there is access for landlords. Well, again, I don't want to overstate how how long that's going to be around or how easily it's accessed, but that was a question that was posed and it is something that has been I think been it's accessed. a valid question, yeah. Okay, thank you. He was recently discussed that we could consider establishing a local version if the state version doesn't prove reliable. Any further questions? Dan. The, um, the housing group that the mayor and council member um, Barker and I um, convened the community solutions work group. Um, that was one of the outcomes of that that was recommended by a, a housing um, person, a, a advocate or um, someone that works in the, in the industry. So there, there is a state fund. I'm, what I'm advocating for is some type of local product that would, would help subsidize any type of damage to a unit. That's all. Any further questions from the council before we start the public hearing? Okay, Terry, could you see who signed up? So there were two clipboards up there, one to sign up to speak to the public hearing and one for the open public comment period. If you put your name on the wrong list, no problem. If I call your name, just tell me you're not on the right list. If I get through the uh, hearing list and your name wasn't called, I'll, ask, uh, I'll give you an opportunity to come forward and speak. Um, the rules we follow are you'll have three minutes to address your comments to the city council. Um, we, we're here to listen. We're, we're not going to have a conversation. If you ask questions, we'll treat them as rhetorical. We won't we'll just listen to what you're saying. Uh, there'll be a timer going, and the timer will go off uh, when you have 30 seconds left. So when you hear the timer, that doesn't mean stop talking. It means now it's time to start wrapping up your um, comments. Um, I think that's probably all we need to say. So I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Mr. Greg Winter, if you'd come forward, followed by Anna Kemper and Chris Diley. Thank you, and uh, I just want to thank the council, Mayor Linville, and city staff for the very thoughtful and thorough process that you went through in considering the many sides of this issue. I think it's, I think the product that's come out is really terrific, and while this is not going to solve all of our affordable housing problems, it's going to give some people a fighting chance that currently are shut out of some of our local housing market. I do have one specific recommendation, and, and City Attorney Rafato just made reference to it, and that is under the Source of Income Ordinance, the City Enforcement Civil Infraction Section. Um, uh, it, I think it would be a good idea if there were escalating penalties to repeat offenders in that section to, to really um, encourage compliance with this. Um, but that's my only recommendation. Otherwise, I think it's terrific. and. Um, I should have mentioned that I'm Greg Winter, Executive Director of Opportunity Council, so sorry I didn't start out that way. So again, thank you for all your hard work on this. Thank you, Greg. Anna Kemper, you're next, followed by Chris Diley and then Galen Hertz. Hi, uh, I'm Anna Kemper. Uh, I just want to speak a little bit more on the housing ordinance that we're talking about today. I'm a resident of Bellingham. I have been for four years. Um, I'm also a member of the York neighborhood, and I uh, appreciate everything that Greg had to say. Um, I'm also here on behalf of the uh, Associated Students of Western Washington University as the local liaison. Um, through my role as a local liaison, I've had many conversations on housing, and I've heard a lot of stories from all over the community about rents increasing without notice, and others about folks who couldn't even apply to certain housing um, because of no Section 8 that was you know, plastered across the application form. My own house's rent went up this last year by $500, um, which is a ridiculous increase with little notice that was given to the occupants of my house. City Council, you all should pass this comprehensive ordinance in favor of adopting protections for residential tenants. Um, I support the establishment of an enforcement program to prevent discrimination. Um, housing is a human right and the basic foundation of a healthy, thriving community, and especially important in our community where 54% of the people that live here are uh, resident, uh, rental, 
rent, excuse me. Um, we must protect the most vulnerable in our population by passing this ordinance that works to prevent source of income discrimination for prospective residents and uh, requires proper notice for rent increases and of lease terminations. Um, I also just want to acknowledge that owning properties and being a landlord is a difficult job, but creating this culture of trust and respect is important for both sides of the renter process um, and this ordinance to protect renter rights passed by city council will be an important step in that process. Uh, so I agree with the ordinance and how it is written, but I also just want to encourage city council to add a section encouraging landlords to provide voter registration information to every renter during move-in. Um, I think this would be a really important step in increasing voting accessibility in Whatcom County. So thank you for the short statement. Um, council members, I appreciate all the work that you do, especially on this important issue of housing and how complex it is. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. Chris, you are next, followed by Galen Hertz, and then Jordan Terrence. Terrence. Hi, my name is Christopher Dyle. I'm homeless here in Bellingham. Um, this ordinance won't even apply to me because I can't find anywhere to rent. I don't get enough money through Social Security. Um, there's just no affordable housing. Um, I've been here, I would, if people remember, I came in with a minor stroke in 2008. I could barely walk. I had my service dog, Palenka. And she and I were sleeping on the sidewalk in front of a church out in Fairhaven um, for three years. And then they let she and I sleep in their boiler room for two years. So for five years, I was living out of plas plastic bags hidden in the bushes there at that, at that church out in Fairhaven. Um, I could barely function. Uh, what I've noticed is that, well, first and foremost, as the ordinance, it, uh, well, let me back up. The Washington state law prohibits rent control. That's the issue. We need rent control. Nobody's addressing that. So now take a look at the ordinance. It's based on discrimination. In 1993, when I came out of the closet being gay in the workplace, I tried to utilize Tucson's ordinance prohibiting harassment of gay people in the workplace. It didn't work. For poor people, it is, it's just impossible to prove discrimination. I had a crystal clear case proving discrimination occurred. And my pro bono lawyer, Pam Liberty, there in Tucson, she didn't even show up for one of the most important meetings I had with the city of Tucson. And ultimately, the city of Tucson decided against me. So I lost my job. I ended up being homeless, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I come up here in Bellingham, 2008. In 2008, there was a two to three year waiting list for housing. In 2011, it went to a three to five year wait for housing. Last year, there was no waiting list for housing. You couldn't even get on it. Presently, in order to get on a waiting list for housing, you have to win the lottery through the Opportunity Council just to get on a two-year waiting list for housing. Why do we have to resort to gambling methods in order to get housing in Bellingham? So I'm not even on a list. I haven't been chosen from any, any lottery system. I'm not even on a list. I'm, I am so incredibly, incredibly depressed because this is what we're looking at. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it is so insufficient to what needs to be done in order for it to, it to get housing. And I'm just getting worse and worse, mentally ill. My health is getting worse. And I've got no prospects of getting any housing anywhere. And I'm like, so I'm going to have to leave here? And I go to another state where I've got my license plates on my van now, or uh, Washington, and everybody gives me a hard time. Like, why are you coming down here? Why don't you go back to Washington? Because I can't find anywhere to live in Washington. And then when I live in my van, I can't find anywhere to park to live in my van because I get harassed doing that. So it, to me, it's just, it's drastically insufficient for what needs to be done for housing here in Bellingham. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Chris. Um, by the way, um, there's a, probably 30 or so people uh, signed up, and if you all take three minutes, and please, if you have three minutes worth of comments, say them. We'll be here for about an hour and a half. If you can say your piece and less uh, and give more time for other people, that'd be appreciated. But if you need three minutes, go ahead and take all three. Galen, you're next, uh, followed by Jordan Terrence, I believe is the name, and Cecilia Meadows. Good evening, Council. My name is Galen Herz, and I'm here on behalf of the Bellingham Tenants Union. We support the proposed ordinance because stronger tenant protections for the most vulnerable in our city mean our city will be more healthy as a whole. We are, we are glad the testimony from our neighbors who have been discriminated against due to the source of their income was met with open hearts. And we'd especially like to thank council members Hamill, Barker and Knudsen and city attorney Rafato for their work on these issues. The success, the success of this ordinance rests in robust enforcement. 
We would like to see offenders who discriminate or break tenant protections repeatedly be faced with increased financial penalties. Also, can you share which specific agencies will be responsible for enforcement and how tenants can seek justice if they've been wronged? The probable passing of this ordinance reflects our city's commitment to housing as a human right, just like the passing of the Bellingham Home Fund. We also know these steps aren't enough to address our shared housing challenge in Bellingham. Even if you have housing assistance and you're not being discriminated against, it is still extremely hard to find housing because of our dangerously low vacancy rates, reportedly hovering around 1.5%. In addition, the housing shortage has enabled massive rent hikes as tenants are forced to bid against each other for a scarce amount of homes. To solve this, we need greater availability of homes and more affordable homes in Bellingham. We can do this by one, building public housing on vacant and underutilized city property or donating, or donating it to housing advocates such as Colshan Community Land Trust, and two, changing zoning laws to allow for more homes and more affordable home types throughout the city such as duplexes. Also, as raised by the courageous folks who are camped outside and some of who are in this room, we need to stop the sweeps Rather than chasing individuals who are experiencing homelessness and camping around the city from place to place, provide them with basic resources to camp cleanly and safely, such as a dumpster, clean water, and porta potty. Allow our neighbors to continue to camp if they keep the area clean, and similarly, provide an area for people living out of their cars to park safely. People who are experiencing homelessness need to be included and have a voice at the table for these policies. I encourage community members like you all um, to voice your support for these common sense progressive solutions and make sure that everybody has a safe home they can afford. This ordinance is a good step and I thank you all for it. Um, let's pass it, celebrate our victory, roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you maybe don't come here very often. We try to create a safe space, which means that not only do we ask you not to boo, we also ask you not to applaud so that anyone can speak and the room is safe for them regardless of whether or not you disagree with them. There may be members of the audience who hold an opposite point of view. So I understand the natural urge to applause a well-spoken speaker you agree with, but that's one of our rules here. Thank you very much. Um, Jordan, you are next, then Cecilia Meadows, then Adriana Solenberger. Uh, is there a, a Jordan Terrens, Terrens, something like that? Who lives on Violet Lane? Okay, uh, we'll just go on to the next person. Cecilia Meadows, followed by Adrian Sullenberger, and then Teresa Muniz. Muniz, thank you. My name is Cecilia Meadows. I've been an, a landlord in this town for over 50 years. I've had um, about averaging 50 tenants at a time. Uh, I would like to uh, remind you people that landlords don't generally, I've never known of them to ask a tenant to leave unless the tenant is scaring out their other tenants, busting up their rental unit, and or not paying their rent. I've only gone through one full eviction in 50 years, and it took me four, uh, 55 days to execute that e eviction as fast as I could. I was afraid for my other tenants because of the actions of the tenant that I was trying to get out, and I was afraid for my building because there was evidence of significant damage happening. So I also would like to uh, address the matter of, I've heard the term passed around, thank you, not here, greedy landlords. Um, rents have gone up. I'm really startled as to how high rents are. I would like my grandchildren who are in their 20s to be able to raise their families here. They're telling me it may not work, employment-wise and rent-wise. It just isn't a good place to get started. Uh, so. Um, there's that, and um, uh, I forgot what else I was going to say, but I'm sure it was important. <laughs> um, oh, the city, I've looked at my rents and I've tried to keep them reasonable. The city has hit me with 
quite a lot higher taxes in the past year, in the past two years, higher water bills, um, etc. Despite the fact that the term goes around, greedy landlords, we still have bills to pay. And roofs cost money. On newer buildings, often there's loans that have to be met. On our older buildings, like I've had, um, roofs over 15 years have to be replaced. That's not a cheap thing, et cetera, et cetera. So um, thank you very much. I've made my three areas of points. Thanks, Cecilia. Adrian Solenberger, then Teresa Muirs, uh, followed by Greta Merkel. Good evening. I'm Adrian Solenberger, the landlord liaison for the Opportunity Council. And again, thank you, City Council and the Mayor, for taking time to address these issues. Um, as we face a national and local housing crisis, I think these are all necessary to support to move forward. And for our community members, if you are low income and experiencing housing discrimination, then I would be that person that you could come to to find resources to help advocate. You can find me at the Opportunity Council Monday through Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, Teresa Muirs, you're next, followed by Greta Merkel and Rosa Rice Peoples. Teresa Muirs, Bellingham, I am, I'm not going to repeat what everybody else has said, except thank you very much for the job that you've done. Thank you for listening and thank you for, for hearing. And uh, we have encountered people on the streets who are homeless, who had vouchers, who have their vouchers have expired because they were discriminated against. So this is a really important ordinance and thank you. Please pass it. Uh, thank you, Teresa. Uh, Greta Merkel, then Rosa Rice Peoples, and then Cora Cole. Hello, um, my name is Greta and I'm a resident and a tenant as well in Bellingham. And I'd just like to echo support for the passing of this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rosa, you are next, followed by Cora Cole and then Giovanna Orecchio. Hi, my name is Rosa Rice Palopko. I use she or hers. Um, I'm a resident in Happy Valley, and I've been in Bellingham going on four years now. Um, and I just want to voice tonight, um, first of all, my support for the folks outside who are camping out um, and support their call to end the sweeps in um, Bellingham. Um, I think housing is a greater problem than just what's going on tonight, um, and the ordinance would be a step um, in the right direction. Uh, definitely support the ordinance to end um, discrimination against Section 8 housing. I think that if we want to say we're inclusive to folks in Bellingham, that's a small step in getting there. Um, and I also, um, yeah, just want to voice my support for uh, voter registration forms um, to be included in the ordinance as um, voting accessibility um, is a really important thing. And we've actually just um, in Washington had some of the lowest turnout in a general election. Um, so thanks so much for your time and for all of you for being here. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rosa. Sorry, I didn't get your last name right. Uh, Cora Cole, you're next, and Giovanna Recchio, and then Misty Parker and Mike Parker, you're signed up together. Uh, thanks. Uh, good evening, uh, City Council, community members. Uh, I'm Cora Cole. I'm a student up at Western and a resident uh, of Lettered Streets. Um, I uh, am here obviously to talk about housing discrimination. Uh, we need immediate solutions to the problems that we face as a community and as individual members of that community. Uh, housing vouchers are how many of the most vulnerable members of our community find housing. Um, it's hard for everyone in this town, but when people are automatically disadvantaged because of the way that they are paying for housing, an already tilted stage becomes more tilted. Uh, banning a source of income discrimination is a critical part of our solution to housing problems. It isn't the only one, and I want to thank everyone who's been uh, working uh, on housing for so long in this community, particularly those who are camping outside, uh, for the attention they've brought to other issues related to housing, uh, including uh, stopping sweeps and the, uh, the need for uh, safe camping locations. Uh, this isn't the only solution to this problem, but it is a solution. And I want to thank you all for the work that you've done uh, on this issue and for the work that we will continue to do together uh, to make Bellingham a safer, safer place for people to live uh, in security. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cora. Uh, Giovanna, you're next, followed by Misty Parker and Mike Parker, and then John Harmon. Hi, I'm Giovanna Recchio. Thank you again for pronouncing my name correctly, my very difficult Italian name. Um, I'm here to fully support this ordinance. Um, I've lived in Bellingham for four years now, and I can genuinely say it's 
my favorite place I've ever lived. And one of the best things about Bellingham is of its, its economic diversity. Um, I grew up in not a super economically diverse place. Mercer Island is not exactly, um, not exactly the most economically diverse. And I can genuinely say that living here in Bellingham has made me a better person. I now fully understand um, from a first person perspective the value that living around folks of different you know, living income levels, uh, you know, makes you a better citizen, it makes you a better person. So I think it's especially important as well here in Bellingham as we all make our home um, in the land of uh, the Coast Salish to be able to work together to make our communities more inclusive, sustaining and equitable. Um, landlords should not be able to discriminate against potential tenants based on where their income comes from because ultimately as someone who's proud of our social system, what good is a Section 8 voucher if you can't use it and put a roof over your head? Um, a 90-day notice for rent uh, increases is also very reasonable and much needed. Bellingham has low vacancy rates and our neighbors absolutely need at least 90 days um, for uh, rent increase notices. Um, and like Rosa said, Washington State recently set very low record uh, turnout numbers and I think that engaging more people in democracy is always a good thing. So so um, I do, I, I encourage you folks to pass the ordinance. We need to continue to tear down the barriers that block low income residents from becoming our neighbors and supporting this legislation is key. I urge you to pass this ordinance and make Bellingham fairer for all because housing is a human right. Thank you. Thanks Giovanna. Misty Parker and Mike Parker, you're next followed by John Harmon and then Jesse Worland. I think you'll just get one of us. So my name is Mike Parker and I live in the Sunnyland neighborhood. Um, I'm here to echo a bunch of sentiments you've heard, but you know, homelessness and housing and, and having folks having to sleep outside um, is, a, is a massive societal issue. And I think sometimes we can just get stymied with, well, what can we do? And a lot of times um, doing the messy details, maybe pragmatic and smaller changes such as an ordinance may not seem worth it to some but if we can move the needle incrementally, I think it is worth it. So I'm here just to say thank you for the work. Thank you for putting together work groups, getting a wide diverse array of opinions. Thank you for a well thought out ordinance. Um, I do like the escalation clause, by the way, my boss was right. Um, and props to everybody that's here tonight and showing up and showing that they care about having a just um, and equal community. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, Mike. Uh, John, you are next, uh, followed by Jesse Worland and John Ramsey. I'm uh, John Harmon. I'm the executive director of the uh, Bellingham Housing Authority. And I wanted to thank the council for all the effort they put into this. I, we were part of the process and we were glad to help with the information we had. And it strikes me as a very fair and balanced ordinance. I've looked at some of the others from other communities. And I've talked to people in the other communities. They don't solve all the market problems, but they do introduce a very large measure of more fairness to the system. Um, and I wanted to say that this is not a situation of landlord versus tenants. This is a very uncomfortable situation for many people because it's such a tight market. You know, landlords are overwhelmed with applicants in many cases and applicants are underwhelmed with lack of choices. It is a really hard situation to deal with. And I think if we all think of it as cooperating together, we'll be more successful than if we are adversarial about it. Um, we have, as someone said, about a one and a half percent vacancy rate, and that is very, very low. A healthy rental market is considered to have about a five percent vacancy rate, where you have a good balance between supply and demand. We are far from that, and a long ways from ever getting back to five percent again. Uh, now, people who qualify for Section 8 vouchers have very low incomes. I mean, you would be amazed at how low these incomes are that people live on, eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a year. How they make it, I don't know. But they do. With housing assistance, it is more possible for them. Um, with the Housing Authority, only has enough funding for helping so many people in our voucher program. It's around, in round numbers, about 1,800 households. And the only way we can get more people into the program is when people leave. And people do leave, they don't stay in it forever, but very, very few openings, so we use a lottery system to select people. We're not happy about it, but it seems to be about the fairest system overall. 
So all I can do is urge us all to have patience and cooperation and try to get along and work through this bad situation. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jesse Worland, you're next, followed by John Ramsey, then Michael Chavario. Hello, I'm Jesse Worland with um, uh, Skagit and Whatcom County uh, 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 um, Socialist Alternative. Um, so as a full-time worker who works manual labor for $12 an hour, um, who cannot afford housing in Bellingham, I have to live with my parents, and uh, no, I'm not a student. Um, this ordinance is welcome. As someone who struggles with housing issues, I have a hard enough time finding a housing option that I can reasonably afford without even thinking about discrimination based on income. And on top of that, having no protection against a Hail Mary rent increase. But this isn't the only problem with our housing system here. Um, rising rent prices and gentrification pose a continued threat to working class people and those who cannot afford to live in such a tight housing market. Housing is a human right, and our current laws do not cover the issues that, are necess that we need to address. We need public housing to serve everyone who needs it. We need services for people without housing. We need to stop the sweeps, make porta potties and dumpsters available, and housing for all. If we cannot afford to guarantee everyone housing and basic rights, even with all of our vouchers and social safety nets and restraints on capitalism, we need to consider a systematic change. Thank you. Thank you. John Ramsey, you're next, then followed by Michael Chavario, and then April McCabe. My name is John Ramsey, and I'm a real estate broker in Barclay Village. I believe the intention to provide affordable housing is excellent. I completely agree with the, uh, the sentiment to do that. But I'm concerned that the current proposal tends to limit affordable housing rather than increase it. And because it has to do with the fact that ultimately the issue driving less affordable housing is the lack of supply. I work in real estate. It's not an easy time. People sometimes think, oh, this is a great time to be on real estate. The, the prices are so high. It's a hard time to be in real estate because it's difficult to find uh, properties to sell. We're doing fine with it, but it's, it's, not an easy, it's not an easy time to be in real estate. There are a lot of people out there who would love to invest and would love to invest specifically in affordable housing. But every time there is a new regulation, each additional new regulation, even if it's a relatively good regulation, ultimately means that it is harder to provide any form of housing. Supply and demand basically uh, run the market. The reason our pricing is so high is because the supply is too low. There's a lot of demand out there. It's not going away. I want to talk about a couple of examples um, that I have seen. One, I've heard people talking here this evening as well about wanting to get housing and not being able to afford it. Ultimately, I believe that taking away regulations allows that to happen more, such as I agree with the gentleman who was talking about wanting to create more zoning options, create more affordable housing options, create options to have tiny houses and the like in town, give us more opportunities. We can then find investors who will come in and build it. Ultimately, unless we wanted to go to a socialist model, complete socialist model, and I imagine there's some here who would like that, have you lived in China? Have you lived in East Germany? I have, I've lived both in China and I've worked in, in former East Germany. Those are not models we want to go towards. One, the environment was completely destroyed and state ownership tends to lead to that. Um, I see my time is coming to an end. I want to talk about a positive example in East Pasco. There is a, a, um, a community there called Tierra Vida this, it's been developed by uh, an apple orchard owner there. It's completely private. And basically what they're doing is they're selling homes to people, a lot of them lower income, but it's all private. So I believe the market is the solution to have more supply rather than less. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And Michael Chaferro, you're next. Michael will be using the microphone up there. No, push the button. 
How about now? There you okay. Go. Uh, I, I support the proposed ordinance. I'd like to thank the council for your very hard work, and I'd like to uh, thank the courageous people who are camped outside. Uh, regulation of the housing marketplace, as I think uh, you all know, will sadly not solve the problem because the speculative real estate market is the problem. I encourage the council to promote enable and find funding for residential real estate land trusts on the mode of the local Kulshan Community Land Trust uh, that will remove residential land from the speculative market. I realize that my remarks are the opposite perspective of the previous speaker and that's one of the wonderful things about our country that we can have different approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, April McCabe, you're next, followed by Cal Leenstra and then Nikki D'Onofrio. Hi, my name is April McCabe, and I am an organizer of the Bellingham Tenants Union as well as a housing case manager at Opportunity Council. Um, I've spoken a few times now at these as well as the um, town hall meeting regarding housing. Uh, I've seen the discrimination happen, and it is devastating to uh, families and individuals in our community. So I'd like to thank you so much for um, the support of this ordinance this far, as well as the community members that are all here today, um, especially the ones that participated or supported the Stop the Sweeps um, camp out this weekend. It seemed like it was a really good success. Um, I had kind of a long scribble of things to say, but I really feel like I'm reiterating a lot of things that have already been said. Um, I've reviewed the ordinance and I am really proud of it, but a big concern I do have is the enforcement. Um, I think that um, really if, if there's not something set in place that it, it won't be successful and um, the people that we are trying to protect and support um, will continue to not be served. Um, that said, I also think it's gonna make a big difference um, nonetheless. Um, moving forward, I encourage the council's members and the community though to move forward with urgency because I think this conversation has been years behind and I'm proud of what we've been doing these past few months but I think we need to pick it up. Um, and with that addressing um, this true state of emergency that we're in, this housing crisis, um, and we need to start having more conversations about creating more available safe, affordable homes, whether that's rezoning to um, create spaces for more diverse types of housing um, and other, other things like that. I think we need to have more of those conversations more often. So again, thank you though so much and I'm excited to see everyone here tonight. Thank you, April. Uh, Cal, you're next, followed by Nikki D'Onofrio and then uh, Amy Glasser, did you cross your name out? Okay, then after uh, Nikki will be Kate Dunphy. Go ahead, Cal. Yeah, good evening, Council. Uh, Cal Leenstra, Bellingham. <clears throat> the top four whereas is attempting to justify the implementation of the new Chapter 6.11 of the BMC deals with low rental vacancy rates. Vacancy rates are low because demand for units exceeds the, the supply. It's unclear how the implementation of new regulations, which will result in higher cost to both property owners and tenants, will help alleviate the situation. When you increase regulation and costs of providing a good or service, you get less of it, not more. If we had more units, rents would be lower and availability would be higher, all other things being equal. The proposed legislation does nothing to advance that objective. Rents are high because of a lack of supply. But just because there is a temporary lack or low vacancy rate, that doesn't mean property owners should not be allowed to ascertain with a reasonable degree of certainty uh, <clears throat> that their prospective tenant can actually pay the rent they agreed to pay. That's just good business sense. The same reasonable procedure would be exercised by any of you if you had a unit to rent. 
Exercising good business sense is, in selecting tenants is not discrimination, as the proposed ordinance implies. It's just common sense. Finally, in addition to declaring portions of the ordinance unenforceable, real estate attorney Katie Berger indicates the subject ordinance could be bad for both property owners and tenants. Why? I quote, first, for cause evictions further burden the court with fact-based issues requiring a trial. Secondly, the judgment against an evicted tenant will be astronomically increased. That's her words. Trials are expensive. Thirdly, evicted tenants will have quote unquote bad actor evictions on their records making it difficult if not impossible to find future housing and potentially excluding them from subsidies for housing. This ordinance has taken our ability to choose the least intrusive option and could actually hurt many t uh, tenants, unquote. How does the proposed ordinance encourage an increased supply of aff affordable rentals? It doesn't. And thus the problem is exacerbated, not resolved, for both owners and tenants. And I therefore strongly urge you to do the right thing and vote no. Thanks for listening. Um, thank you, Cal. And Nikki, you are next, followed by Kate Dunphy and then Stephen Gawkley. Hi, my name is Nikki D'Onofrio. I'm a renter here in Bellingham and I've rented in this city for over nine years total. I also work for a local nonprofit that provides free legal assistance to low income renters. So I'm familiar with this issue um, both personally and professionally, although I'm here tonight representing myself as a private citizen. I strongly encourage the City Council to adopt the proposed protections for renters. I support ending discrimination based on income source and I also believe that providing more notice to renters um, of rent increases and um, ending of leases will help keep more people housed in this extremely tight market. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Kate Dunphy, you're next followed by Stephen Gockley and then Robin Meyer. Hello. Hi, I'm Kate Dunphy. I'm a renter and I'm a social worker with the Tenants Union of Washington State. And I'm here to urge you to support the protections against source of income discrimination and to extend the notice periods for rent increases and terminations of tenancy. I understand why good landlords here in Bellingham cannot imagine a tenant being treated unfairly. But every week I work with renters facing these issues throughout our state. We all want to be able to grow roots and to plan for our family's future. But in this housing market, those dreams have become increasingly difficult for many to realize, especially cash poor families and families of color who have long been discriminated against by our region's racist housing practices. Supply and demand won't help us correct those wrongs. Extending the rent increase and termination of tenancy notices will not create a burden for property owners, but it will make it easier for families to plan their next move if they're one of the many renters suddenly facing economic eviction in a city with so little affordable housing available. Because vulnerable families also have to be able to first access housing, I want to urge you all to support the source of income discrimination protections. I just spent two months working with a single mother who was evicted by her property manager in the middle of a fixed term lease, even though a local nonprofit had promised to pay two months of her rent while she was in between jobs. Because there was no law against this source of income discrimination, her landlord was able to choose to evict her and her two children rather than accepting the two months of guaranteed rent. We need you to ensure that no more Bellingham families are discriminated against for using a Section 8 voucher, their church's rent assistance, or any other form of income. Property managers should be required by the ordinance to complete tax forms or other requirements needed for tenants to access rent assistance, and the protection should be named as applying to both prospective residents and to current tenants. I also absolutely support the Bellingham Tenants Union's calls for transparent and strong enforcement of these protections because those elements are crucial to the ordinance's success. Please support all Bellingham families in being able to both grow roots and to plan for our futures by passing this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Stephen, you are next, followed by Robin Meyer and then David Weasley. Good evening, council members. My name is Stephen Gockley. I'm a resident of Lettered Streets. I retired last year as a civil legal aid lawyer who represented 
dozens and dozens and dozens of tenants. I continue to volunteer my services uh, through the Law Advocates Tenant Clinic. Um, this draft ordinance obviously does not address the numerous long-term systemic obstacles to affordable housing for low-income people. However, right now, in the circumstances that we face in our current housing situation, low-income renters face several unnecessary barriers that undermine their housing stability. The draft ordinance does address some of the most important of those. There is no justification for a landlord excluding low-income persons from having rental applications even considered simply because of their source of income. It is exceedingly important for renters to have as much advance notice that their rent is going uh, to be substantially increased or that their tenancies are being terminated, given the current challenges that they will face looking for a new rental uh, with the current vacancy rate. The draft ordinance, which you put a lot of work into, will reasonably and fairly address both of those barriers with very little burden on, on landlords. Uh, partial though it is, I urge you to adopt the draft ordinance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Robin Meyer, you're next, followed by David Weasley, then Tyler Busich. Thank you. My name is Robin Meyer. I'm up here. Up there. Thank I'm you. the Acting Programs Director at Northwest Youth Services, and I also just want to thank everybody for the work that you have done on this ordinance. I think it is absolutely a step in the right direction. Um, one concern that I have is about um, sort of the um, de incentivizing that it might do. Somebody mentioned earlier that rather than going for a no cause eviction, a landlord might be incentivized then to do a four cause eviction, um, thus jeopardizing future housing um, for that person, as well as um, some of the way that the subsidies work, they don't actually qualify as income. They're documented as ability to pay the rent, but what we see a lot of times in advertisements for um, units is that people are required to have three times the amount of rent in income, which subsidies actually will not provide. They will provide um, kind of a promise to pay, ability to pay the actual rent amount, but they would not screen in as triple income for that person. And so um, I just think that that's something to consider when we talk about enforcement or application. Um, but I also would urge and encourage us to pass this in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Uh, David Weasley, you're next, followed by Tyler Busich and then Kelly Owea. Good evening. My name is the Reverend David Weasley. I'm a pastor at First Congregational Church of Bellingham, United Church of Christ. I'm also a tenant in the Barclay neighborhood. Um, I was recently reviewing a survey of all of our congregation members about uh, the issues that most concern them, and about 90% list housing and homelessness as their primary issue. So uh, they would be upset with me if I was not here tonight. Um, this is also a time of year when we begin to think about the time when uh, Jesus himself was homeless and later a refugee. So this is, of course, very important to many of us. Um, I appreciate the work that the council has done. Um, and so many local housing advocates, homeless and tenants, have worked together uh, to make this uh, ordinance, and I urge you to pass it. Um, with the Bellingham Tenants Union, I, I want you to, ve to, to, to develop a, a strong enforcement mechanism, um, and I uh, hope that you will find a way to collaborate with groups like Catholic Housing Services that are concerned about that uh, potential disincentive um, to find a way um, that uh, nonprofit and social service landlords can um, uh, avoid cause evictions on the records of tenants. Um, I, I was uh, shocked when I moved to Bellingham to find out that this was not already part of our uh, landlord tenant law. I've previously been fortunate to live in municipalities where that was already covered, so I'm glad that we are getting up to speed, but I know that uh, I am glad that so many of us are working so that we can continue to build momentum uh, to house everyone in town. Um, and I think I speak for many folks when um, I say I'm eager to continue showing up and being present um, with my colleagues here in, in the audience. Um, we'll be back for the next ordinance and the one after that until we have enough housing in town. Thank you, David. Tyler Busich, you're next, followed by Kayla Oweya, and then Diane Foster. Is Tyler here? I thought the mistake, sorry about that. Okay, Tyler, no problem. Kelly Oweya. Hi, I'm Kelly Owen. I'm the senior attorney with Northwest Justice Owen. Project in Bellingham. <laughs> and uh, as with Stephen Gockley, who, who uh, worked for us for quite a long while, we, uh, we provide civil legal aid to low-income people in a four-county area. 
And in that role, we uh, represent a lot of low-income tenants, and I very much appreciate the work that's been done in the city on this ordinance. I think all three provisions of this ordinance will be very helpful to low-income tenants. I've heard positive impacts of similar ordinances in Vancouver, Washington, which I know are the base uh, or the model for these ordinances. The, the definition of uh, income, source of income discrimination is broad, and we think that's appropriate. Um, it's useful that, that there's administrative enforcement of the source of income discrimination provision because there are not and, and never will be enough private attorneys available to enforce that. So that, that we're very happy to see that. Um, the increased notice for no-cause termination and for uh, notice of substantial rent increases will be very useful as well to low-income tenants. Uh, people have spoke repeatedly about the challenges of finding rental housing in this area, so any amount of increased time will be helpful. Um, this is structured as an affirmative defense to an eviction action. Uh, so it, that makes it very important that if this ordinance is passed that the city uh, do affirmative ed education of landlords so that they understand uh, the, how this applies to them and what they need to do. Um, it, it's also uh, useful that the ordinance provides for actual damages and attorney's fees if someone files an eviction action without giving the 60 day, at least a 60 day notice if they're going to file based on uh, no cause termination notice. An eviction action filed in court is uh, very harmful to people's ability to rent in the future, so we think that damages provision will, um, once, once landlords understand it's out there, will provide a, a good incentive for people to comply with the ordinance. I want to address the issue of uh, some housing providers who say, well, we'd like to be able to provide no-cause eviction notices even if, in fact, we have good cause and need to get that person out rapidly. The, the, that's an attractive argument on the face of it. However, 20 days notice is simply not enough time for anybody to find housing in the current market. It's just not possible. And in fact, 20 days notice is not even a realistic amount of time for someone who's going to be uh, homeless to say, find a place to store things. I would suggest that some of those landlords might, we might want to start looking at beefing up use of mediation and other sorts of alternative dispute resolution methods to deal with that issue. But we think a longer term notice is essential. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Diane Foster, uh, you're next. And Hi. Diane, just a second. Um, so that is the, the last button? person who signed up to speak at the public hearing. After that, I'll open the floor for other people who want to come forward and speak. So I'm sorry, Diane. Go ahead. That's okay. Is there a button? No, it's on. Okay. All right. Um, Diane Foster, and I live up in Sea Home neighborhood, and um, I'm speaking in support of this ordinance. And thank you for doing it. And um, I won't add too much to what previous proponents have said, but I will say from personal experience that we spent many years moving from one crummy rental to another and being evicted because we were a family. And in one case, they were actually very honest about it and said, you know, we can rent this house bedroom by bedroom for much more money to students than to your family. So I was hoping that there was a just cause eviction clause somehow in this ordinance. Um, but I, I'm definitely glad that there is income, no income discrimination. Um, I had a devil of a time trying to find Section 8 housing for my schizophrenic sister and uh, it was an absolute nightmare. And But it wasn't because there was discrimination. It's because simply the voucher wouldn't cover everything, including the utilities. So I think it's an economic factor as well. Um, but um, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Diane. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak to the issue of the uh, proposed ordinance? If you would, just come forward and line up over here. I think, uh, Dick, you're going to go first. Um, if you do want to speak, uh, just simply state your name for the record and begin your remarks. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dick Conaboy. I live on South 46th Street here in Bellingham. Uh, I want to mention up front that I'm a member of the Whatcom Veterans Advisory Board, and we deal with issues kind of like this, but I'm not speaking for the board tonight. I'm speaking for myself. I'm also speaking as a veteran because part of this deals with uh, the vouchers that veterans get, uh, a, you know, the equivalent to uh, HUD vouchers or so much uh, about, about like that. At any rate, um, 
I, I, th I think back to uh, 2004, I believe it, Gene and, and Terry will remember when we first started talking about uh, rental registration and inspection, and uh, <clears throat> we finally got that passed about 10, 10 years after that, and it's now being handled by Rick Seppler very ably, and I'm very happy for that. Uh, but all the time that I was working on that issue, I was hearing the stories that were being told tonight by people who can't find housing. Uh, it was not only that their, their, their place was, was rotten and uncared for, but that they feared eviction, uh, they feared trying to find another place, uh, that the rents were too high, and I'm happy that all of this is de finally dealing with that. And I'm also happy that something that I called for five or six years ago and was really hard to get somebody to start to establish it is that we now have a tenants union, thanks to people like Galen Hertz. And we need somebody, uh, we need an organization there to step up and speak for the tenants. And I'm very happy for that. And I urge you all to pass this ordinance uh, immediately. Thank you. Okay, would anyone else like to come forward? Go ahead and just state your name for the record. Uh, good evening, my name is Jeff Thompson. Um, I just wanted to give a few viewpoints from my point of view. I am a landlord in Bellingham, have been for 10 years, which means I bought at the bubble at the height. There was many years, uh, just this last year is the first year I've cash flowed. Um, I've had nine years where I've hadn't had enough rent coming in to pay the mortgage, let alone all the repairs that go along with it, tenants moving out, repairs going back in to get it back in you know, order for the next tenant. So not every landlord out there is greedy. Not all of us you know, discriminate. Um, but I do think, echoing what was said earlier, I should have the right to know where the source of money is coming from. I don't get into business with somebody I don't know. Just like I want to know what's going on. I want to make sure the funds aren't illegal. I want to make sure, you know, that it is there to pay. Because if they can't pay, I can't pay. And then that's a big issue as well. Um, the other thing, too, that a lot of people have spoken about is, you know, yes, I agree. Housing is a basic need. Location is not. This is a great city, great location. Fortunately, it's an expensive one. Not everybody can afford to live here. That's the way it is. Um, we all make decisions as to where we choose to live, how we want to live, and go about our way, making sure we can do that for our families. Um, we shouldn't forget that just because somebody's here, that they're entitled to always stay here. You know, you have to be able to find what works for you, and if it's not this city, then you got to find elsewhere. Um, and also, the last thing I'd like to say is. A lot of the comments that were made tonight sounded like there's, you know, the more focus was on the shortage of available, affordable housing. That really is a separate issue in my mind of source of income for potential tenants uh, and renters. So I think we need to separate those two issues, deal with them individually. They're not the same. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to come forward and state your name and give some comments? I'm Kelly Krieger. I've lived in Bellingham for about 14 years. I've never rented here. I have watched my college-age children have to gamble, play a gambling game to get housing. I have grown children living in this community now who I believe do some of the most valuable work in our community and can't afford to buy a house. That's wrong. They can't afford to rent their home. That's wrong. So I'm fully in support of the ordinance, and I really thank our city council for taking on this super challenging issue. This is, this is a crisis, and we're in crisis mode, and I really appreciate you taking all your time to do it. Um, I am in full support of the ordinance. I'm not going to go into a lot of what other people have said, because I think it has all been said, and I know you've all heard. I'm really impressed by how many people are here in support. I think that says a lot. I think the ordinance is a great step, but it's only a first step. Let's pass it and move forward. We have a lot more work to do. 
one of the works, one of the things we have to do is find more housing. And as the gentleman before me just said that there are two separate problems. We don't have enough housing. We don't have enough affordable housing. The ordinance goes so far as to protect some of our vulnerable tenants, but it doesn't provide more housing. Um, so let's move on from that. The Bellingham that I know is a compassionate and caring community. We value our diversity and we lift up members of our community who most need our help. Right now, a lot of those people are our homeless population and you can see a lot of them here in this room tonight. And they've been camping on the city hall grass for about three nights now. We really need to move forward with a plan to help our homeless. I really like the tiny homes plan proposed and I hope that we can find a place to move forward to start that pilot program. I heard a couple people out here who've camped here over the last few nights say it was the first safe night sleep they'd had in as long as they could remember. Camping on the grass at City Hall. Think about what that means to not have a safe night's sleep and to get one camping in City Hall. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Somebody else? I'm Leslie Shoemaker Black and I've lived here for 27 years. Um, I moved here in late 1990. We had a two bedroom apartment for $300. Those times have changed. But Bellingham is my home and I've also benefited from um, m most of the low income programs. Uh, when I was 22, I became uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder and we lost my job at the bagelry. And um, anyway, I can, as, as someone that's been through it and it, if it were not for the Sun House, I would be homeless if I hadn't jumped off Deception Pass. I would be drunk or dead or something. Um, I wish, um, okay, but back to the original thing. A few years ago, I had a landlord. He was really religious and because of my bipolar, he thought I was a witch and evicted me for no reason. And they just make up stuff like that. And. Um, you know, for whatever reason, or if you've ever had a police come to your house more than twice, you're out. That's Bell Mall Villa on 32nd Street. It doesn't matter if they're there to let you, you know, file a missing persons report. They just kind of, they don't like the way you cut your hair. But, um, like, especially for single homeless men, like, something like the YWCA where you can rent a room for a year or two while you get on your feet for a couple hundred dollars, all that GP land down there, when are we going to use it? It's close to town. Make a shelter. Homeless people are going to be on the city streets in front of businesses anyway. At least show how great Bellingham is, you know? And also on Girard and I Street, uh, 20 years ago was a halfway house and a detox center run by St. Joe's and that place is empty but there's rooms in there. People would love to share a room if they could have a safe place to you know transition to treatment or whatever but anyway thank you for um, listening. Thank you and we're going to go up here to this gentleman. Hi um, Joe Jeffrey. I am uh, you know a renter here. Um, uh, I'm not a student. I'm self-employed, work full-time, I'm a commoner and a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I heard a few things earlier about economics and you know how, how uh, supply and demand curves and so on and so forth and just really need to point out like land is not a real commodity. It's a fictitious commodity. The price is entirely made up. No one produced it. God, Allah, Gaia, the All High, whatever you want to call her, him or it, put it there and we use it. So the price is already distorted. It's not a pure market. It's already regulated. Private property itself is a regulation. So the idea that putting a new regulation in the way of the market would make it worse is a joke. It's a sad joke that damages people. It damages people's real lives. We need places to live. You know, and, and my other point that I want to bring up is, you know, like I, I listened in the 90s to the Republicans talk about the class war, the class war, the left wants the class war. This kind of stuff, this, this is the class war. Not allowing people to live in a house because you don't like where they got their money from or you think they're too poor and you want them to go away, that's class war. That's leaving them on the street to die. 
You know, we, this city, I, I think I've heard it said before in this meeting, this city spends, what, $300,000 a year on sweeps? More probably, that's just like the number that we can find. We are already wasting money and letting people die. You know, we, we, need, we need to be compassionate. Real people are, are at stake here. You know, not just the market, real people's lives are at stake here. So I fully support the ordinance, but we need to go a lot farther than the ordinance. It's just one small step. Thank you. And over here. Hello, and thank you. Um, my name is Sarah Gooden. I'm an 18-year resident of Bellingham, Washington. I'm a working professional and a graduate of Western Washington University. And I'm also a recipient of subsidized housing. I wanted to address um, an issue that wasn't brought up it is probably secondary to the lack of housing that's available in general, but I also wanted to discuss um, income inequality and a lack of opportunity for people to make more money in this city so that they can move out of subsidized housing. I have, there's no restriction to me having a house somewhere else. I don't struggle with issues of drug abuse. I'm not fleeing domestic violence situations. Every second that I'm in subsidized housing because I can't afford to live here, I'm taking up space that could be given to families who are living on the street, who are dealing with mental health issues and need a place to receive support services to break out of the cycles that create homelessness. There's no reason for me to be in subsidized housing except that if I didn't, I would also be homeless. And that is because I cannot find a job that will pay me enough to find a house for my son and I to live. So thank you so much for passing this ordinance. I'm 100% behind it. It's been wonderful to hear all the speakers tonight, but um, we have a long way to go. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who hasn't spoken? Would you uh, like to up there? Yeah, hi, my name's Teresa Mansour, and I live um, downtown Bellingham. I've been here for 53 years, actually, born and raised in Bellingham. I love Bellingham. It's a beautiful place, but it has drastically changed. I live, actually, I'll be very honest, in Walton Place, and I think that this is a wonderful idea, wonderful plan, but the need for the homeless, like I have people that break into our garage. I wake up every morning and there's someone sleeping in the you know, the little consignment store, there they are. We come out and they're sleeping with a loaf of bread, peanut butter, and jam. They have nowhere to go. It's like the gentleman down there, he says, I'm homeless. I, there's no option for me. And as much as I think this is really important, I think that, like, we need more shelters. We need something for the people. Do you know when someone goes to jail, if they get arrested at 3 in the morning, the day they're released, it's 3 in the morning. There was a 19-year-old kid sitting at Jiffy Loop. I'm like, why don't you go? I got a, he, he, the mission's closed, so he can't get in, and he's fighting with his parents. There's nowhere for him to go, so he sleeps in Jiffy Loop. I see all day, every day, at my apartment, right where I live, people sleeping on the streets, sleeping in the grass, parking in the WTA parking lot down in the corner. I don't know, it's just, it's horrific to see these people and they, the, the, the mission gives them lifetime bans. How do you give someone a lifetime ban from a shelter? It's crazy. But anyway, thank you and I do believe this is a you know, step in the right direction and I really thank all of you for doing this but it's a greater need for the ones who, this isn't even an option, like they're sitting here and going, well this is fine, how do you do? But I, I'm not even able to get onto this because I don't have an option, I don't have any money so. Anyway, hopefully we can come up with something for the ones who are super struggling. Okay, so we are still having a public hearing on the ordinance. There will be a chance for pub open public comment on other topics or the general issues of homelessness. If you'd like to speak to the ordinance, now's a good time. If you want to speak to other issues, that will come next. Mine is about homelessness. Could you just wait and do it next? Sure can. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to speak to the proposed ordinance? Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and bring it back to the city council and ask what we'd like to do next. Um, I think it might be nice to clarify a few things, then well, we will take can, a break because some issues that were raised. Can I yeah. just make a suggestion? Since we've had a lot of different uh, dialogue tonight, that we have a work session as soon as we can right. and go over all this and then come back and, and 
do something. If you don't mind, I'd really like to follow up with what the last person said, if that would be okay to do that as a closing for this section. Because sure. it, it is in, in, in regard to housing and, and this work, and I am in favor Michael, of this ordinance. Got, yeah. we're doing no, um, right we, we, this, is, this is our meeting, so I will okay, try to sure. run it. We will have a, a, a time for you to talk, and I assure you that, that our memories are pretty good and we'll remember okay. what just happened. <laughs> um, thank you. So we do have a suggestion to, rather than take any action on this, but to uh, bring it forward to a work session for further discussion and possible passage at a future date. Is there anybody else who, Dan? Mm -hmm. yes. I, I, I agree with that. I think that that's very prudent. There are a few things I want to make sure that I get into the work mm -hmm. session. So the graduating fines for multiple offenses, I think we need to have a discussion around that. Um, the termination versus eviction mm -hmm. uh, language that was brought up by more than one um, constituent. And then the clarity on Mr. Power's email regarding a negative outcome through a cause eviction that Mr. Afato brought up and, and that was brought up a couple by a couple of speakers tonight. So I'd just like to make sure that we covered those items and any, anything else the council wishes I, to see. I think there's one more too, Mr. President, and that was the um, discussion on enforcement. Which you know, yeah, I, I was going to bring that up. There were numerous there. questions about enforcement. There, there are two avenues of enforcement in here, but I think we want to discuss that further. That was a concern of many people, that there is enforcement. Pinky? And uh, also whether or not we're going to do something locally around mitigation funds or um, if we can include that in our discussion as well. For people who take Section 8 vouchers, yeah. if, there, if there is harm as a result of that, what they can, okay. Right. Anything else on uh, discussion of moving this to a work session? Dan? Briefly a follow-up. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, so clarity around the private action uh, and then the City of Bellingham enforcement on repeat offenders. Just some clarity around that. Thank you. April? Um, when we speak about this again, uh, plans for the city for this affirmative education for landlords, I think it's going to be really important. What date that we're looking at um, implementing? There was some concerns around uh, the Hearst decision and how that's going to be affecting property taxes and that's going to be coming out in February. Um, so we might be seeing another rent increase due to that. Some people were asking if we could hold off until March so people could set their rates. I don't, I don't know if that's necessary. I do know that for some of the large organizations through the state uh, that represent landlords and property management that they uh, would like a little bit of time once, once we set this so that they can catch up with lease amendments and different things like that, um, what that will look like. So uh, we can talk about that. The one thing that I did ask um, in, in our regular session last time was, um, full disclosure, I, I, own, uh, I own two rentals, my husband and I, and we were, uh, along with Dan, the people that brought this forward, we feel that it's extremely important. And um, quite honestly, for your smaller landlords, uh, typically are often, I would hope, we do give more than two months notice if something's going on and we need to change. Um, rent increases are very different, um, I think, from that. And when you get into property management, it has to be a little bit more uh, pragmatic. But uh, none of these things, for every conversation a landlord had with me, they couldn't quite get me there to say why we wouldn't just do this. Uh, it's something that I already do, and I think that it's responsible for us to be doing. The only thing that I heard um, that I couldn't nail down, and I did send John an email, but I didn't hear back, is is there going to be a limit to the amount of time when somebody starts that process to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to start the process of, um, I, I'm not even quite sure how it works, but you get to the voucher and then it, it goes into uh, an inspection and then it goes into do you get the voucher or not. That process can typically be pretty fast, but there are anecdotal situations of somebody who's been going through that process and they're, um, their unit stays vacant for a month and sometimes longer. So I don't know how we want to handle that if there is some type, because regardless, we're talking about keeping our vacant, trying to keep our units occupied. And if this means that something might happen and, and somebody's pushed out to having a vacancy for over a month, something like that. The other question is that the, the um, unit has to be vacant when uh, inspected. And I'd like to know if that's federal or if that's a local, because many of the units turn over within 24 hours. So asking somebody to go through that process and then leave their rental vacant, um, I think we really need to hold our human and social services just as accountable as those, um, the tenants that we're doing as well as the landlords. So figuring out 
either uh, if we set some type of a trip on this so that in one year we can ask landlords, did they have problems with that? What, were, what did they see? Or if we put something specific in this to say, um, there's no reason somebody should have to be homeless longer than they need to be or, or out of a home that, that we hold um, each other accountable. And I think John said it really well, we collaborate to really uh, make sure that it's working well for the landlord, for the tenant, and for the people that are supporting the vouchers. So that's gonna be a hard one, but I wanna make sure that we're discussing it and we might have to have John back to talk about that. I think um, just to acknowledge that voter registration was something that we brought up, but um, our planning department there a problem? Oh, okay. Our planning department uh, said that they were going to work on a process uh, to do that with um, our rental registration. And so I don't know if we need to clarify, but there were many people that uh, suggested that they'd like to see that, and we're moving forward with some of those things. And um, there was some questions, too, with um, month to month, and, and what does that look like if somebody's on a month to month lease? Do these still apply for 60 days? So those are the things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, so, I think just a second. The, the, most, the discussion before us has to do with uh, referring this to committee or taking action me the tonight. Whole. Committee, the whole. committee of the whole. Those right. Are we're about and we we'll make sure those are included. I would, I would urge that we not try to rush into it and get it done before the end of the year because I don't think well, that's Well, and that happen. was my discussion. I, I, I was hoping we could actually schedule a work session for the next meeting, but that's next week. Um, I think and it's I don't too know soon. if staff I feels they'll next. be ready. I, staff may feel they'll be ready. We've been chewing on this for a while, but I'd like to ask about that. I know Mayor Kelly would like to speak, and I, maybe Mr. Seffler would address uh, the issue whether or not one week is, is enough to, for us to at least have a work session on this. So, Kelly, go ahead first. Well, I know that there's a lot of issues that have come up here at the very end, and this was something that was a little more targeted. Focused. I think it's, yeah, focused. I think that it's good to have a work session about that. And then, um, obviously, people said this is the first step, so there's going to be a lot of other conversations <laughs> that we need to have about this. So um, I think if we could kind of separate out what we want to do for this ordinance in particular, what you'd like to add um, in a committee and then add a work session or more work sessions or after the first of the year for the things that, that are beyond potentially the scope of this particular ordinance. Because I felt like we were expanding the scope and we need to know how it's gonna work and that would be a good, uh, that's why I brought up enforcement and other things, because I think that would be a good focus for the work group or work session that Jean was talking about. April? Well, I, I think, and I'd love to hear from Peter and, and Rick, but we have been working on this for quite a while. The things that I brought up, other than the affirmative education for landlords that Kelly brought up, these are things that we've been mulling over and wondering how, how we're gonna do, what are we gonna approach, and how, how would we put it in an ordinance. So I really feel like, not that we have to pass it at the next one, but a good working session might get us to where we need to be. And I think that's what wrong, I was saying about yeah. this, yeah. Yeah, but uh, that we have a, not we come and talk about it again and then have a work session. We have a work session on the 11th and see where we get from there. Mr. Seven. Okay. You know, the challenge of back to back, we, we first of all, um, as staff, we, we understand the urgency besides advancing this, but we also want to advance it in the most thoughtful manner. Um, the challenge we have is just one of calendar. We would not be able to get materials to you before your next meeting. So essentially, we'd be sitting at this dais giving you answers and questions without the ability for you to consider it fully. And we're certainly happy to do that, but it doesn't allow you to have a chance to review the materials ahead of action. Um, if you feel that would be of merit, always bring things for you to consider. But if you want us to submit sort of in writing and research this out so that you and others can take a look at it and give their comments, we would need additional time. I'd like to combine two comments, uh, you, Kelly, and Rick. Uh, if we do keep this focused on this one ordinance and the three issues identified here and improving that language, I think we could move that conversation forward quickly at the next meeting. And then all the other issues, some of which I think can be taken up at a later date and continued, they needn't slow the issue down. If, if we stay focused on this ordinance and these three issues, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if that really is uh, possible and acceptable to the council and possible by staff. Mr. Rafato? Yeah, uh, from my perspective, since we do have back-to-back -back meetings, it's just a matter of um, whether you are okay with perhaps not having 
a final version to vote on at the next meeting. Because the way I see this is, it may seem it may seem simple, but we have to have some conversations with the housing authority. Um, and so, if I'm, I'm perfectly happy to come back and start really hammering through some of these specific things, I don't it'll, don't think it'll take a long time. But the back and forth, okay, here's some draft language, that kind of thing. Uh, just be conscious that, you know, when's our pack, we're putting our packet together as of tomorrow afternoon, so. So my purpose is to do, indeed, schedule us for our very next meeting in one week, but be realistic about whether or not we can actually finalize it and move it out the door at that meeting. I don't know how everyone else feels about that, however. I, I, I don't, this is the first time we've brought it forward to the public for everybody to see it. I don't think we need to rush on I think early next year we could uh, flush through it and get it done quick. Maybe we have two I, I don't see, you know, we have one more meeting and that's it. So I, I don't think we need to just uh, put them in an awkward situation with coming up and we not getting through it and then not voting on it anyway. So why don't we just take it up second meeting of January? I'm going to hear from Pinky and Dan and then I'll go back to you, Kelly. I agree with Jean. Uh, I'd like to move this forward, but I think we've had enough things here. We have enough questions that we have to have a little bit of time to get some answers to. So I'd like to see this go to the first meeting in January. I think, you know, the agenda has to be worked on tomorrow for next week. That's That just seems way too rushed to me to get some answers to some of these questions. Dan? <clears throat> so I brought this issue forward, um, I think it's almost two years ago now. Um, this was brought to me by housing advocates and it's been frustratingly slow to get to today, to tonight. Um, but the things that have come out of the discussion, that have come out of the public hearing and have come out of our um, discussions here on council, I'm not certain that we can have, because of our compressed odd holiday council schedule, that we can do a back-to-back. -back. Typically we have two weeks between our meetings and that helps staff get the, the documents and the answers that they need. We're also relying on third party beyond our staff. The, these are the housing providers that um, um, did not respond quickly to, to Councilmember Barker's uh, questions um, regarding timeline and, f and there's some fairness and equity issues here. So I, I wanna make sure that we, the, that the uh, ordinance that we put together is the is a, the one that we can be most proud of and is the most effective and is actually um, going to help people that it's intended to to help so my my preference even having now done this now for for so long <clears throat> i mean i have a yeah anyway it's it's, uh, it's it is very frustrating but i do think the best course of action would be to wait until the first full meeting in january i'm going to let terry speak first then we'll go to you kelly yeah, and I'm agreeing with, with Gene and, and Dan and, and others with this. I think there's a lot of questions. We are still getting a lot of emails in yet today about this. And then after this meeting, I think we're going to get some more comments and other things that we have to consider and look at. We've got questions. So I would like to actually move that we set this over for a work session on the first meeting in January. And then we can have them back to back. Second, but I think it would be the second meeting because the first meeting is. Yes, yes. you don't mean January 8th. Meeting, yes. First regular. For full second. Meeting, yes. We have a motion before us to move us over to the first uh, full meeting in January. Can I hear from Kelly? I'm That's not sure. okay. okay. April had her April, hand then? up, and mine's a little bit broader question. Okay, thank comment. you. April, go ahead. I just want to know is, do you, do you feel, staff, that, I mean, with the what we gave you, you have what you need, or would you like to have a little bit of time at our next meeting just to flesh out some of the stuff that we brought up? Yes. I sort of like her suggestion that maybe at our next meeting we could talk a little more about this just to focus the questions for the real work session. It's really up to council. Um, you know, there's a couple different directions that the issues could take you, so, uh, so I could see some value in that. And I'm, I'm, now I do Gene's have a going comment. to throw something at me. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I guess what I'd say is I've heard a lot of um, support tonight for the skeleton, the basic concepts mm -hmm. that you worked really hard on in the planning committee, Dan's worked on, everyone's worked on for a long period of time. There is such a thing as passing uh, RCW or a WAC and then passing an RCW. Oops, someone okay? 
Um, and, and that might be something we could focus on. I don't want to start this conversation now, but there are some key points that the, the uh, council could say, we want to include this and this and this with a little bit of, of um, kind of fleshing out. And then you write the way you're going to administer it that meets the goals. I mean, that, that is the way most ordinances are, are written. At federal level, it's one page for whatever. And at the state level, it's 10 pages. But then they write about how they're going to, going to implement it, which gets into a lot of the details, April, that I think that you were asking questions about. But the concepts, I think, would be good to, to finalize that the concepts are what you want in an ordinance. And then staff is perfectly capable of, of drafting an ordinance for you. And if you want to wait till after the first of the year, obviously that is easier for, for staff to come up with, but there is an opportunity to pass the first few steps to show we can actually do something, and then we can pass more steps after that too. So I just heard a lot of, of uh, agreement, um, concerns, some concerns about how we're gonna implement it, but a lot of agreement about the value of the concepts that you brought forward. So the motion before us is to move uh, this to the first full meeting in January. Speaking to that motion, um, I kind of don't like that. I would like to at least do something at our next meeting and make incremental progress. I'm with Dan. I think this idea has taken a long time. If we could do something at the next meeting, maybe not get to the goal line, but at least get a little further. But uh, the motion as it stands, I don't know if it includes that flexibility or not. My motion was to, to do it then because I think that will allow us time to submit questions that we have to the staff for them to be able to bring us answers so that we can have that full discussion. Yeah. Okay, any further uh, discussions of the motion, which is to uh, schedule this for discussion the first full meeting in January, which I'm trying to look up to see what day that is. Um, the 15th? I'll probably vote as it is. Mary, while well, you're figuring that out. Uh, yes, April. So I'm just, I'll be voting against this only because I do want to spend time fleshing it out so you're better prepared over the next, Second. it's like almost four weeks before we meet again. I think it's One worth second. it. We keep it fresh on our minds before we take off, give people our intentions. And um, some of these things, like I've suggested, but we don't know if the council agrees moving in that direction. So we need to take the time to make sure that we're all in agreement. It won't take that long. I think we're all pretty pretty much there so I won't be supporting that but not because I don't support this I just want us I want us to keep digging at it even if it's 20 minutes let's just keep talking about it Roxanne can I follow this vote with a motion that we have a work session only a work session at our next meeting and will that satisfy everybody's issues because we have a full agenda that we still have to tend to so let's vote on this and let's see how it goes with the next one that I will make a motion about the motion before us is to refer this to the discussion of the first full meeting in January, which is January 22nd. Any further discussion? Michael, I will Carrie. amend my motion to, to, to have a discussion about issues to bring up for the, the, the one at the first Are there any year. Objections? I just don't want to rush the thing for this week. Are there any objections to the amended motion? See if no objections, we'll consider the motion so amended. The so amended motion now is that we will indeed discuss this issue at our very next meeting, but there will be a full work session scheduled at our first full meeting in January, which is January 22nd. Is there any further discussion of the motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, that passes unanimously. Folks, this is how sausage is made. <laughs> Is there any further discussion on this item? If not, uh, I'm going to schedule a brief break. We'll come back with our regular 15-minute public comment period. Thank you so much. We're in brief recess.
Would everyone please take your seats? Okay, welcome back. We are now going to reconvene the Bellingham City Council meeting for December 4th. We're now on to our second item of business, which is our public comment period. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, we have many people also signed up for the public comment period. Uh, we're running long this evening. We set aside 15 minutes uh, for public comment. It looks like we're unfortunately going to go over, but we're not going to extend the public comment period any longer than that. Um, as before, you will have a three-minute timer. If you can say your piece in, in faster than three minutes and give more time to others, that would be appreciated. If you need the full three minutes, go ahead and, by all means and do that. Uh, Mr. Diley, I see that you are signed up. Uh, so Chris Diley is first, followed by Jordan Terrada. Hi, uh, Christopher Diley. And this is on public safety um, regarding the Dobermans, the unrestrained Dobermans in the back of the pickup truck that growled and snarled and snapped at me on Billy Frank Jr. Street. Um, what I found out was when I went to the Whatcom County Humane Society, they told me at that time that it was a property rights issue, that the man that owned the truck that had the unrestrained Doberman and a pit bull Mastiff Terrier, when they all lunched and snapped at me, he said there was nothing the Whatcom County Humane Society could do about it because that was his private property. Um, what I found out is that they didn't follow procedure. The Whatcom County, there's county code. There's a there's a procedure for them to follow, and I've, I've got the codes here. It's, um, I, I actually provided this for the city, um, so you've got the copy, but it's WCC 6.04.020. And to be succinct about it, it's, it's based on the written complaint of a citizen who is willing to testify that the animal has acted in a manner which causes it to fall within the definition of a dangerous or potentially dangerous under the definition of potentially dangerous, which is quote, approaches a dog upon the streets, approaches a person upon the streets, sidewalks, or any public grounds in a menacing fashion or apparent attitude of attack, or any dog with a known propensity, tendency, or disposition to attack unprovoked, to cause injury, or otherwise to threaten the safety of humans or domestic animals, end quote. Okay, so that situation, it, it, it fit that to a T. So they should have acted on that and contacted that, that individual who, who owned those and not told me, misinformed me, um, because I was completely under the, the erroneous impression that it was a pri private, private property issue, and it isn't, because it's, based on what they told me, it's, it seemed like property rights um, usurped public safety in this instance, but instead, public safety supersedes private property rights in this instance, according to Whatcom County Code. So, because they didn't act on that, I went there by myself and I tried to warn people you know, of the dangerous situation, which I wasn't equipped to do. And so people ganged up on me and I had to resort to pulling my fishing knife out. You know, long story short, thank God they, the county dismissed this case against me because I was scared to death that I was facing like up to a year in jail. And that's why last time I spoke here, I was talking about how, how desperate I was to get some help on the matter. Um, I didn't receive any help, but I just had the, I was just fortunate enough to go to the university myself to the library and I, st I researched the county code and I found this information out myself. So I think that was very pivotal in helping to convince the, uh, the city, the city of Bellingham prosecution to throw out the case, which they did. So I'm very pleased and thank you again to Michael Lilliquist for providing a, a helpful statement to me. Um, and I didn't mean to be uh, too irritable, but I've, it's hard with all the people here. I get stressed out easy and I get irritable. Thank you. Um, up next is uh, Jordan Tirada, followed by Jennifer Mansfield and then Jonah Longhorn. Is Jordan here? Okay, Jordan's not here. We'll go on to Jennifer Mansfield. Is Jennifer Mansfield here to speak? Here. Up there, go ahead. Yeah. My name is Jennifer Mansfield. Um, I want the best for everyone, every person in Bellingham. It is because I lost someone dear to me on the streets of Bellingham that I am here today. When someone doesn't have a support system to fall back on, they turn to their community. We cannot let disease societal mindsets dictate our city directives. Mother Teresa once stated, one of the greatest diseases is to be nobody to anybody. People without shelter or homes are not nobody. They are somebody, somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's child, somebody's friend, 
So I would like each of you to picture someone you love who is dear to you and imagine them living on the streets of Bellingham. I know as a mom that we cannot abandon our roles as leaders, guardians, and caretakers or sweep away what we don't want to see. Bellingham is home to all of us, but not all of us have homes. That is the challenge. How do we best serve our collective family? The city does not want to waste time or money on Band-Aid solutions or deploy counterproductive costly action or inaction. When we provide a space with adequate, adequate outreach and resources to facilitate a path for someone to save, stabilize their life, they can be productive. That is our city's highest calling and highest return on investment. So I am here to advocate for homes now, not later, and everyone who currently needs shelter. Thank you, Jennifer, for you. waiting to give your comments. Uh, Jonah Longhorn, you're next. Is Jonah here? Thank you, Jonah. After Jonah will be James Peterson. I don't know where to begin. I didn't really prepare a speech, but hello, I'm Jonah Longhorn. Um, we need to look at some of our values currently as people of this country, as people of the state, and people of the city, because currently, that flag, we, when we pledge of allegiance, like I said last time when I, when I came to this stage, we don't, we don't follow the same values that we, we ask when we say, I pledge of allegiance to the Republic of the United States of America and to the, to the state, you know, the whole, the whole way through, indivisible for liberty, justice for all. We need homeless housing. This country, I thought, was a, a, a country based on unity, of, of, of brotherhood, of, of you know, constitutional togetherness, equal rights. But it seems like there are people that are more equal than other people in our country, in our state, in our city. And I think that we as people need to realize that we are all just people. And that if you are on the street, you should have somebody to be there for you. You should have somebody to advocate for you. You need people there. And if we are not doing so, then this system that we live in is nothing more than economic oppression. It doesn't matter if it's capitalist, socialist, uh, democratic, republic, Soviet, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. If, if you are not providing for your people as the government, as the, as the country we, we stand for as people, then this country, that pledge means nothing. Uh, there's no reason to pledge to the United States if there is no people on behalf of people supporting people. I don't think I have anything more to say other than please house the people. Thank you, Jonah. Uh, again, um, one of our rules here is that we ask you not to applaud, just as we would ask you not to boo if someone did something. So go ahead and support Jonah in, in, in your own quiet way. James, you're next, followed by uh, Rick Bowe. My name is James Peterson. I'm a president of Homes Now. I live at 5 Sunnyside Lane. First, I'd like to thank the mayor, and I'd like to thank the Parks Department for finally working with us on our summits and letting us use the building down at Maritime Heritage Park for our monthly summits. That was the first win we have got with the city, and I feel like it was a small win, but it's a good win. So thank you all that were involved in getting that done. And our next summit's uh, December 17th, and I invite you all down there where you'll learn a lot. Now, on to the next tackle and fight. I, Homes Now is the one that organized the sleep out that you see out here on City Hall. It's amazing. We have 45 people sleeping out there right now. We had people walking in last night at 2 o'clock that said they've been walking around the streets for two days, sleeping an hour here, an hour there, but no place. This is the first time they felt safe and sleeping. We had 45 people. Uh, there's been no fights, no police calls, no stealing of anything. The porta pots, I check them about every hour. There's been no needles left in there. So the people that say we can't have porta pots because of the drug addicts, I disagree. So we have a list of demands that we want, and we're declaring a state of emergency for homelessness in Billingham. We need a path, path forward to build a project of four tiny homes. And we don't need to have more meetings. We don't need to keep dragging this on for years. We need to do it now. We need safe places for people to sleep outside without the risk of being swept. 
and Maritime Heritage Park would be a perfect one, and we have the details if anybody is really interested. I have the details all worked out. We need a safe place to park for people that are living in their cars and RVs that work full-time jobs but can't afford rent. We need toilets and dumpsters put nearby the camps that you are sweeping. Maybe if you put dumpsters in porta pots and told the homeless, hey, if you keep your camp clean, we won't, we'll let you stay. Hmm. You save the city, what, $400,000 this year? 300000 last year? That's three quarters of a million dollars on this. And we also want uh, you to support the safe storage program for storage for the homeless that would be free to the homeless and open 24 7 for them. Thank you very much. And there's a lot more. Thank you, James. Uh, Rick Bowe, you are next, followed by David Moise. Moise? Is James here? Okay, we'll go ahead and skip James. Is Rick Bowe here? Rick? Okay, so uh, David Moise? Moise? David, thanks a lot. Come on forward. And then I think Lauren Rawls. Okay, you'll be after him. Okay, thanks. Hello, uh, my name is David Morse. Um, I, I became homeless in June. I uh, came here in, in 2000 from Rapid City, South Dakota. I've always wanted to live in Bellingham. I came here in 2000. I was robbed in Seattle. It put me on the streets. What these people are asking for and what I know from being on the street is a, a restroom that we can use 24 hours a day, a place where we can put our, our clothes, our, our stuff, um, clean clothes. Uh, I know it sounds really simple to you, but it's really hard to get clothes so I can go out and look for a job and be a member of society. I've worked my whole life. I'm a college graduate, and I've never been in a situation that's so hard to get out of. Once you fall into this, there's no way to get out of it. I just the, the demands that they ask are the things that I find that we really need, too. And the shelter, I don't want to talk bad about things, but that's scary going there. It's a scary place. It's a bad environment for fights. It's a dangerous place for lice, and there's a lot of people on the streets that won't go there because of that. And that's what I'd like to share with you. Thank you for t listening to me. David, thanks so much. Go ahead and come on forward. Just state your name and let's tell us what you want us to tell us. Hi, I'm outside sleeping uh, to support the homeless. We need a place to sleep. Um, they need a place to sleep. Um, it's very important that uh, I let you know that um, some of my homeless friends have said that they have never had a, such a good night's sleep in a long time and never felt so safe. And I just want to say that um, please let us have some place that we can sleep and that they can be safe. And we'll clean up after ourselves. We're not pigs. As you see outside on your lawn, we're not pigs. We, we take care of ourselves. We want to take care of ourselves because we're people just like you and we're all equal. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Kelly, uh, Kelly Krieger, I think you spoke earlier. I don't know if you're still here. Uh, if Kelly's not here, we'll go on to Teresa Mansour. Teresa already spoke. Teresa already spoke. How about Shovia? Mm, long last name begins with an M. I'm sure it's a beautiful name if you could pronounce it for us. Okay, Shovia Mucharahando. Um, hello, everyone. I know I've spoken before, and I'm here tonight, and I was listening to both sides. I come from a family who do own property. So I know the opposing arguments, and I know the arguments in favor. So I decided to listen to some people who are on the opposite side when we broke. And I listened to what they had to say, what their concerns were, and everything. And my question was, well, if you're afraid of somebody damaging your apartment, what is the security deposit for? What about the insurance that you take out on the property if it's damaged? 
And then I was thinking about the proposal that the ordinance that you all put together. And in order to bring both sides together, we do have to listen to both sides. We can't just assume. So what about a training process for all people within Bellingham that rent, whether it's private, public, or government housing? This has to happen in order for everybody to have a clear understanding. Um, the people who were speaking that said, um, I think I have a right to know what the income is. Um, from their perspective, if I had a property, <laughs> I probably would be a little concerned to a certain point. But with training and education, I would learn why that isn't so important. You understand what, where I'm coming from. We all have to be educated. We all have different biases. We live in America. We know racism. We know sexism. We know discrimination. Let's not deny that. So in the process of passing your ordinance, I'm asking that you also implement some type of class training for every person who has the power to give someone a home to have that education to learn about what happens when people lose their job, what happens when family members die, what happens when something so tragic takes your mind and you can't function. Um, I came here with someone who was speaking of something. I'm on the same level. I have a college degree, never had any drug issues. I even worked in politics. But if it hadn't been for the housing, Bellingham housing, I would be homeless too. You all don't know this, but I spent $900 a month in the hotels for three months when I first came to Bellingham. Time. And I know, I'm sorry, but I kept my room clean and everything, and we have certain stigmas that fit people, and I'm just saying, how do we get beyond that? Maybe the people who own properties, own properties who's concerned with that need to get with the homeless so they can see what they go through and what they experience and see that they do care. We got to get beyond ourselves and live and realize that we live in a society that cultivate these ideals of sexism, racism, and biasism, and it carries throughout every thread of our lives, even into our housing as well as jobs. And income you. is very important. Thank you, Shavia. Okay, thank uh, you. <laughs> next up will be, I think it's Samuel Gooden. That would be the microphone. Okay, Sarah, thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, I think Kelly Owen already spoke. Um, Doug Gustafson. Doug, please come forward. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Doug. I'm with Homes Now, um, working with Jim. Uh, I was gonna, I was gonna say, uh, it, to me, the one thing I heard the most tonight, like as a general concept, that was was people were talking about the market a lot. And you know, if, if, if I'm, I'm, you know, you people have to wonder, how did we get to this point? How did we get to this point where suddenly there's a housing crisis? Oh, you know, over the last few decades, we had, we had during the neoliberal period. Um, the whole system basically turned into a market. So, so we are trapped inside that frame of reference. Uh, it, it, any solution we come up with has to be a market solution. Now, I'm not a socialist or a capitalist or anything. I'm, I'm literally like, let's do what works best for the general public, depending on the situation. And sometimes it looks a little bit more capitalist, sometimes it looks a little bit more socialist. But what I'm saying is this is a real crisis that people don't have shelter, that we're talking about four walls and a roof and it's like food and water, like it's the basics. Like, so, so, but here's the thing, providing cheap affordable housing to everybody is a conflict of interest if you're trying to make money off of property or you're trying to make more money. So that it, the fact that it is a market is the reason why the prices keep going up and up. The actual raw cost of a building with electricity and plumbing isn't that much. If, if you look at the raw cost of materials, it's, it's only when, 
someone has to, be, has to turn it into their piggy bank in 10 years or sell it for twice or three times what it's worth, that suddenly it becomes very expensive. And so if you were to implement affordable housing, those people who own properties um, would actually see their property values either kind of flatten or rise more slowly. And so it, to me, it seems like that, that's, kind, you know, the people who have all the resources, relatively speaking, don't really want to give up that status, you know? And that's, that's what it looks like to me. Um, but, it, and it's a nationwide problem. It's not just Bellingham, it's everywhere in the country. It's, it's, it's a, our, the general mindset of this country that it's all about business and making money and, um, and that's led to a speculative market. Notice that people's wages have been flat though, like people aren't making more money, but everything's just getting more expensive. So that adds up to a homeless problem, that adds up to people getting kicked out of their house because they can't afford it, because it's, it's always assumed that people will have enough money to, to do that. It's like, an, in, impli it's like implied that if you can't afford to live, that you, if you can't afford to live, then you're um, somehow like a failure or you have a moral failing that you weren't smart enough to get more money to live on. So, you know, I, I, I feel like uh, it's, I, we, I'm really glad of what we're doing out there because, because we're, I think that by putting it on your guys' doorstep, we're actually like maybe having more of an impact than if we just talk about it. And, you know, it just seems like these meetings are meetings that lead to the next meeting, which lead to the next meeting. So it's just, yeah, that's all I have to say, so. Thank you, Doug. Leslie Shoe Black, you are next, followed by uh, Amy Glasser, if Amy, if you're still here. Is uh, Leslie here? Leslie's left. Okay. How about Amy? Or is Amy Glasser still here? Mm -hmm. Amy, you can speak from up there. Can. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. For one thing, thank you so much for letting us sleep outside um, to show the community how respectful and kind people are, even though they don't have homes. Four days with 35 plus people uh, unhoused, probably up to 45. Four days with no violence. Four days with no drug use in bathrooms, four days of no thefts, totally wonderful people, much like you and me. You all know by now that I'm a mental health therapist. From my perspective, we have been coexisting so successfully this past four days because there's a sense of security at that camp right outside you. Reports are the best sleep they've had in a long time. And I've talked to most of the people there from my, with my social work hat, not just my home is now, not later hat. They finally felt safe with their belongings. They felt safe even near people they didn't know because people were looking out for each other. They still are. They're guarding the camp while we're all in here because they realize that what we need to do is work together. And they know that they have to take care of things to show you who don't have to show people that you have to take care of your homes in order for them to get homes. The reports are also, these are our elders, people 65 and older. That's horribly disgusting. I know it's not your fault specifically, but you can't help. Their children, their pregnant women out there, their families. There are men who can't see their children because CPS says you have to have a home first. We have no shelters for men who are looking to get their kids back. We have a drop-in center. And I'm begging you, don't spend our, our tax dollars on a 200-bed drop-in center. That won't work. It doesn't with 80 people. It's too crowded. It will get too crowded, and it's not safe for most of the people who need it. Mental health does not do well with a lot of people who have mental health problems. It only makes it worse. People struggle to stay sober and mentally stable while not having a sense of security or stability. I applaud them all. They're amazing survivors and I'm a better person for getting to know some of these unhoused people better this past weekend. I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised to know that some unhoused people just need to know that someone gives a shit. Not just with words, but with actions. Not just a committee, but with money. So please help in the following ways. Let homes now have some properties to do a pilot project. Get bathrooms out there 24 seven in dumpsters. Please make their places to be safe. They're out there. They don't have any other place to go, council. There's no place you're letting them go to camp. They have nowhere else to go. I really appreciate the bathrooms provided by, by the Lieutenant Morrison 
and for everything you've done so far. Please don't just talk. Please, we need this now. Thank you, Amy. Up next is Don Tony. Is Don here? Oh, yeah. yeah, Don, go ahead and come forward here. And after Don, I believe our last speaker will be Gregory Clark. Uh, yeah, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody for um, the tents and sleeping bags. And uh, yeah, I had a great time. I don't want to, I don't want to pack up, but yeah. Anyway, I have a problem with uh, the locks on the uh, bathrooms. Like we are on a timer to when we can use the restrooms. I don't feel like that's fair. Um, it just makes me mad. Um, also, like public places, people, uh, you use the restroom and they come in and say, you got to hurry up and get out. I have a problem with that, a big problem. And um, I don't think it's anybody's business. You know, as long as we're not hurting anybody. If I'm changing my clothes or whatnot, can't do it outside. And the cold. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you. That's all I got to say. Thank you, Dawn. And then Gregory Clark. Forgive me, I'd probably be all over the place a little bit. Uh, this discussion. Um, I'm fairly newish to Bellingham from, um, e from Everett. I spent time in Puyallup in Seattle. Um, first thing I want to say is you guys have the most beautiful city in all of Washington, period, hands down. It's clean. It's gorgeous. Um, the people are great. Um, there is a slight lack of telephones to call 911. Um, bathrooms after 6 o'clock, if you don't pay for coffee, you have to sneak around the, the uh, corner, which I believe in some cases is actually a sexual offense or predator something for peeing outside nowadays. So you have kind of put yourself in harm's way. Um, uh, telephones, water, so fresh, hot, and cold. Uh, really, where I would start, honestly, if you get paid, you're usually a target. Um, if you don't get paid, you're usually targeting. And that's how we work together outside, where you're either doing each other dirty or getting done dirty and then turning around the next day. So. Um, if we can all just kind of, uh, I, I like the idea of whoever said uh, maybe training amongst all of us to work together and uh, maybe help under, let people understand what's going on in our minds. Uh, um, uh, we, it, it's, it's, it is pretty lonely out there and drugs are easy to fall to uh, when, when you have, have nobody and it's cold and sometimes that's how, how you identify with people. Um, I can tell you if I need something anywhere along I-5 corridor, I look for a backpack and, and hiking boots if I need to eat. Um, and I don't think that anybody looking out their, their car windows looks down on us by no means. I think that everybody wants to add to each other's lives to a degree. I don't think anybody just really really knows how to um, and maybe not understand it. So um, either way, keep up the good work. I'm glad everybody's talking and at least communicating. Um, next president, you got my vote? <laughs> Where are you at? Um, love you guys. Okay, Gregory, thank you very much. So that completes our 15 minute public comment period. There's extra people who didn't sign up, please. Um, we've please. already extended the public comment period. They've been waiting outside to speak, please. Um, how does the council feel? Um, right. I'm seeing divided uh, yeah. point of view. Are we all in agreement to hear them, please? Well, please. We, we do have we have yet to actually begin our meeting, so please. so please. Um, the sense of the council up here is, I think, uh, to let just a few more people who indeed have been waiting for a long time. But uh, we do meet regularly. We are available by email if you have access to it, and you can come at our next meeting. Um, we are readily available. Um, there just may not be enough time tonight for everyone. Sir, if you just state your name and tell us what you have on your mind. My name is Bennett Mulford. I'd like to speak about my experience being a homeless man in this town. It feels almost like 
the line is not paper thin or anything, but the wall seems high and too thick between trying to get out of where you've been put and where people are seeing how you should be stuck. And that's just how it feels. There's, it, it, it's degrading. You feel subhuman at times. And it, it's not inspiring to try and help the system when the system seems to scorn one. You know, together, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. But when the parts aren't going to work together, then there's dissolution and uh, conflict. But we can see beyond that, and we can, you know, create a society that is beneficial to all. And there's times that it just it just feels like we're, you know, abandoned if we're not bringing a payroll in the moment, and that doesn't make us want to <laughs> try and do so. But I don't want to say that it's uh, uh, messed up too much, but it could be a better. Okay, thank you. What was your first name again? Bennett. Bennett, thank you, Bennett. Sir, maybe you can be the last person. I don't know if anyone else has waited. Or up here. All right. So. Um, okay, one, two, three more people. Go ahead and state your name. Marshall Zohar. Okay, so um, I've been, I was homeless from 16 to 18, and uh, because me and my, my mom was mentally ill, and she didn't have any money, and she was living off of SSI. So she didn't want me interfering with her life, so she kicked me out. I had been working previously prior to that on my own. Um, I had been in multiple institutions due to the fact I was trying to steal from my food because she wouldn't give me any. And um, so I moved up here, and it's just like really hard because there's all these homeless people, you know, and it's just being a young person, because there's lots of us around here, it just doesn't seem like it because we hide out. There's a lot of young people, and when we try and go around the other crowds, you know, I've seen lots of it happen to people. I've seen, like, you know, 17-year-olds dosing up heroin, you know, shooting up in the park, man. It's just we ain't got nowhere else to go. And then, like, Francis Place, I, luckily, I have a place to stay, you know. I have Francis Place. But there's other kids out there, you know, who don't, and they're stuck out there, you know, all night with, like, people shooting up, trying to rob people. I've had people pull knives on me, guns on me. I've had, like, you know, my, the clothes on my back taken from me. I've been beaten up, I've been, you know, I haven't had food to eat, I've had a struggle. I've been arrested multiple times for having to steal because I didn't have anything to eat, you know? And like, we don't have anywhere to go, you know? Like, when I was, I didn't, I wasn't homeless here, but when I was living in Portland, you know, like, there were no restrooms, like, where do you go, you know? And then like, there's nowhere else to eat, nobody wants to feed you. And it's just like hard, and I just like wish, I think that the small houses idea and like opening up zoning is a good idea because I know it's like an old saying, but you can give a man a fish and have him fed for a day, or you can like teach him how to fish. You know, y'all y'all aren't teaching us nothing. Y'all just throwing us in places with other drug addicts who want to stab us and take all our money. And that y'all ain't showing us anything. Y'all ain't teaching us how to survive. Y'all ain't teaching us about taxes. Y'all aren't helping the homeless people. You know, I'd much rather have like a camp community with somebody teaching me how to build a house than somebody putting me in a house and having to still struggle for my food, not knowing when I'm going to be going in, like, like having any money to do anything, you know, and it's just depressed, like, just like depressing all the time, no, nothing positive. And there's just nobody's trying to help us. Nobody's trying to give us any skills to do anything in the world. And you guys just look down on us. And then we end up 30 years old and you guys just, I don't know. Thank you. Right. We'll, we'll go up here for this yeah. gentleman. Michael Sean Sullivan, uh, but I am homeless. Um, I became homeless by a death threat that I didn't make in the Ferndale court system to an EMT, Ferndale, who's having an affair with my wife later on, married her. That's how I became homeless. So I've seen a mentality level with the police force in Ferndale, Bellingham, the EMTs, um, they're very um, snobby, come off snobby, like we're just nobody. I had a cast on my leg, I just placed my bone a little bit, the way he was talking to me, you know, I just basically, conversation over last summer. But uh, anyways, I've been asleep at midnight, woken up uh, by the manager or whoever was the manager of the property and five cops came with guns drawn. I was sleeping on a piece of cement, trying to stay warm. That's it. But you see the whole thing with my, um, my uh, the EMT? They took my daughter away for five, five years, okay? 
I heard that she tried to commit suicide. I haven't seen her for two and a half years. She's in treatment now. All stemming from a lie by an EMT and my wife. I've been screwed with like uh, the cops. I've been put charges on me for what, choking a sign? Right now, I'm currently court ordered to take Adderall, which Compass Health isn't giving me. And then with Compass Health, the medical community, the first time I was with him talking to him about this post-traumatic stress thing that I got going on, and I get really angry if I'm not medicated, there's a bunch of other people in front of this door. As soon as I was done talking, you heard the footsteps. Completely unprofessional. I was a head usher at Christ the King Church, leader in training. I knew Steve Mason, Jason Hubbard, Alex, or Felix Anderson. A lot of the old schoolers at CTK, small group, was an emphasis. Um, I was a productive member of society. But because there's no accountability for these guys, th those guys right there, and the EMTs who are looking at my bike yesterday, trying to see if it's stolen or not, because they don't like me because I've called out some people, right? So what I see, I see that you created an environment for crime that you're making money off of because there's nothing for us to do. And you know that. What do you expect us to do? Just fall, you know, be, walk around and be civil and, and not break the law? But then the cops come and they lie, distort the truth, manipulate. I've seen it in action. I've witnessed it and it's absolutely pathetic. I've been beat up by cops, trapping this arm down in the snow while the other one's wailing on me. Don't resist. But I couldn't speak. And you know why I did that? Because somebody audibly said my daughter was screwing with me for the 200th time I heard my daughter commit a suicide. So that gut-wrenching pain, I snapped. There's a serious dark cloud over the police officers. There is no compassion, man. Time. There's no compassion. And that's serious because there's people out there that are losing hope. And when you don't give them compassion. Okay, thank you very much. Seriously. And we have, I think, one more speaker over here. Go ahead. Just state your name for the record, please. Neil Prusson. Um. Just to help out the, uh, uh, the community and the uh, homeless, um, I've noticed that our uh, pay phones aren't as available uh, to the homeless and even people that live indoors. Uh, the only reason why I'm mentioning this is because uh, what if uh, a homeless person or a person that lives indoors doesn't have a cell phone and we don't have our pay phones available to us to go and call 911? Uh, it's just a request on my part and a suggestion, I would suggest, if you would please, keep the pay phones in Bellingham, please, because it's not, it was to say that I don't have a cell phone myself. What if I see something where it's like somebody's being hurt, killed, or something's going on, and I need to call 911? Uh, over here at the waterfront, there used to be a pay, uh, a pay phone. It's not there anymore. Um, I'm not sure or not, but even though at the uh, bus station, I'm, I'm, the people could probably help me. It, it, doesn't it take a, a, a card nowadays over there at the uh, bus station to go ahead and just make a, a simple phone call? I'm, I mean, I'm not sure if, you, it'll, if it'll still do 911, but uh, my request still would be to go ahead and allow the homeless, even people that uh, live indoors, that, uh, I mean, their cell phone could be broken or the battery is dead, and we don't have a, a pay phone to even call 911 to go and help ourselves indoors or outdoor people would be my request uh, towards uh, everyone, uh, mm -hmm. just to help out everyone, period, actually. Thank you, Neil. Okay, let's now begin our regular meeting, which consists of report outs of work sessions that occurred this afternoon, committee by committee. Sure, Roxanne. Just a small request for the sake of time. If the item was for information only, could we try to be as brief as possible about it and get to the matters that we need to vote on? I just would appreciate mm -hmm. that for consideration. First committee to report out is the Justice Committee, chaired by Council Member April Barker. Okay, we had three items for committee. Uh, to let people know if this is your first time watching this, you can access these committees uh, on BTV 10. 
through the internet uh, as well. So we are going to be keeping them brief. If you would like to learn more about uh, those, you need to go back and check that. And you can also email us and we can give you bigger updates. So we had three items for committee. I was joined with uh, Council Member Borneman and Vargas. The first one was a discussion on draft resolution of guiding principles for justice and justice related items. Uh, we had an over 20 minute conversation and got through two principles. So uh, I was given some direction, I uh, had asked council to make sure that they, uh, or at least the committee, sorry Roxanne, I was supposed to keep this short. <laughs> the committee to, thank you. The, the committee to make sure that they uh, send me their revisions. I'm gonna need to be writing that up and have that in uh, late tomorrow or early Wednesday. So please make sure you get those if you would like to comment them on the 11th. So those will be published uh, by Thursday. Um, sec Second item for committee was a request to convene jail stakeholders. Uh, we talked with Mayor Kelly about uh, discussions on how we're going to move forward to make sure we have access to the jail, especially for our pretrial. There was a motion to direct the mayor to work with Sheriff Elfo to develop a small working committee uh, that resembles the jail stakeholder task force that will develop short-term solutions to facility capacity and long-term objective, objectives for alternatives to incarceration. The committee unanimously recommended, and I so move. Second. We have a motion before us to ask uh, the mayor to uh, convene a jail stakeholder group with a similar composition to that of the previous jail stakeholder group to look, work on both short-term access issues to the jail prior to the termination of our agreement to use the jail. Uh, they, we don't run the jail and they, they can kick us out if we have an agreement to use the jail. And also longer-term issues that have to do with reducing use. Uh, um, people in the jail and incarceration. Is there any uh, further discussion of this motion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passed unanimously. Okay, our third item was criminal justice and public safety impacts to the city. Uh, I do recommend if you're interested in this to go ahead and watch. There was a presentation to explain how much money that we're spending um, on police, criminal justice, uh, prosecution, um, jail, municipal court. Um, there was uh, information only, but there was a suggestion for the mayor to work with staff to develop a plan B for potential um, costs of temporary booking and holding if things don't go the way we'd hope with uh, Sheriff Elfel's discussions. And also looking at costs for staff position that would relieve um, some pressure off the attorney and muni court so they could continue to look for more diversions and um, do, do their regular work. And the mayor said that she would have those conversations and maybe bring something back for us. So with that, end of committee. Thank you, April. The next committee that met was Public Works Public Safety. Terry Borman is chair for that committee. Thank you, Michael. We had one item before the committee. It was a bid award for the Seahome Hill Communications Tower Replacement Rebid Project EK-0001. Bid number 48B-2017. The Seahome Hill Communications Tower Replacement Project involves the installation of a new city-owned communication tower and associated equipment compound within the Seahome Hill Arboretum. The city received seven bids which were publicly opened on November 9, 2017. Award Construction Inc. was the responsible bidder who submitted the lowest responsive bid of $730,464, including any applicable uh, Washington State sales or use tax. The engineer's estimate was for uh, $558,772.35. The committee recommended awarding the bid to award construction, and I so move. Second. We have a motion before us to award the bid for the construction of the Seahome Communications Tower, Project EK-0001. And um, I'd just like to mention that uh, part of the tower we pay for by uh, private telecommunication companies and other entities that also use the tower. Any further discussion? All those in favor of awarding the bid signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> that passes unanimously. End of committee. Thank you very much, Terry. Finance and personnel was the next committee to meet. Roxanne Murphy is the chair. Well, good evening, everyone. We had one agenda item. It's the Lake Patton Golf Course 2018 budget amendment. The city is now partnering with a new business that is managing our golf course. And since it's a new business that we're working with that requires this budget amendment, so the committee recommended approval of this budget amendment, and I so move. Second. 
We have a motion before us to amend the budget to uh, accommodate the new user agreement for the golf course. Basically, it shows a $1.3 million increase in revenue and the exact same money being used to going out again. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. End of committee. Thank you very much. Parks and Recreation was the next committee, and April Barker was chaired that committee too. We had three items per committee. I was joined with Councilmember Vargas and Murphy. The uh, first item was a bid award for Bloedel Donovan Park floating dock and piling replacement. The um, committee recommended uh, this contract be awarded to the lowest responsible responsive bidder, Bellingham Marine Industries of Ferndale, in the amount of $359,000. $769.83, which includes applicable sales tax. That was a unanimous recommendation, and I so move. Second. Second. We have a motion before us to award the bid for the uh, reconstruction of the floating dock in Bodell Donovan Park and also replace the pilings. Any discussion of this? All those in favor of the awarding the bid signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously as well. Second item for committee was a resolution to increase fees at Arnie Honey Aquatic Center. There was some uh, conversation. Uh, we decided unanimously to recommend passing of the resolution 2016-31, which establishes facility rental fees at Arnie Hanna Aquatic Center. It's approximately a 5% increase for facility use. Uh, that is the recommendation, and I so move. Second. A motion before us to uh, adopt the updated uh, facility rental fee for Arnie Hanna. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And the third item for committee is the strategic plan and project expenditure guidelines. Uh, again, uh, due to the time that we have now, if you want to learn more about this, there's some great projects that are coming forward. Uh, includes Squalicum Creek uh, Trail Connection between Cornwall and uh, the Old Maurice down behind there, all the way to Squalicum Creek. Um, there's Many other things, James Baker View King Mountain uh, acquirement of land that we're looking at, the Cordata Community Park that we're moving forward um, per the mayor's direction very quickly, which is wonderful. If you want to learn more about um, the plan, then you can watch it uh, on BTV or on the internet. The um, The committee unanimously recommended passing of the strategic plan and project expenditures guideline for 2017-2018 Greenways program. And with that, I so move. Second. We have a motion before us to adopt the strategic plan as well as the project expenditure guidelines for the Greenways program in the two-year period of 2017 to 2018. Over the lifespan of that period, the tax revenue coming in and spending out is approximately $7.3 million. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The strategic plan is adopted. End of committee. Thank you very much, April. We now go on to Committee of the Whole, uh, which I chair. The Committee of the Whole had four items before us. The first one is an ordinance amending the 2017-2018 biennial budget, providing for adoption of the mid-biennium adjustments to the biennial budget pursuant to the terms of state law. Basically, this is the city budget, and we have a two-year budget, and halfway through that cycle, we make millions of dollars of changes to that budget. Interestingly, no one ever comes to speak on that issue, and no one did again today. There was no discussion. But the details are indeed in your packet, and they've been published several times. We had numerous work sessions on it. This afternoon, the committee recommended approval of this uh, budget ordinance, and I so move. Second. Second. Yeah, okay, we have a motion before us to approve the budget adjustments for the mid-biennium period. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The budget is adopted. The next item before us for discussion of the Shoreline Master Program, in particular a limited amendment that was begun as long ago as 2013. It's been in the works with the Department of Ecology for that long. It's finally coming back to us and our next meeting we'll have to respond to a letter to agree to the changes suggested. Uh, basically this affects only one very small area of the waterfront and none of the area of the waterfront that's currently under discussion for redevelopment. That'll come forward at the next meeting.
The third item was a summary of the City uh, Council's, uh, Bellingham City Council activities for 2017. There's a letter in there and a report. If you would like to know what the City Council has been up to in brief and what our staff does, has been doing over the past year and our focuses and our priorities, um, those materials are published and you can go online to find them. The fourth item was a discussion of committee structure. That is, the Bellingham City Council organizes our activities into committees. We discussed ways of reorganizing the committees, which we do on an annual basis to more effective effectively uh, allocate work and to get our work done and to focus on emergent issues. For example, this year we added a justice committee. The justice committee will continue. This afternoon there's a recommendation to restructure those committees to recombine uh, where the various um, Agenda items would be assigned. Uh, I believe what we're doing is removing public works and combining that with the natural resources in Lake Whatcom because public works actually handles natural resources in Lake Whatcom. The public safety is a standalone committee and then combine planning committee with the community economic development committee because again planning department actually encompasses planning and economic and community development. Um, that summarizes that discussion and we'll assign committee members at the first meeting of the new year. Um, meeting minutes for approval is the next item. I believe, is there a mayor's report? Did I miss that or? No, not yet. Well, we do have some meeting minutes uh, for approval. Uh, the, the November 13th uh, meeting minutes. Move approval. Second. Any changes or corrections to the meeting minutes for November 13th? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting minutes are adopted. Uh, old and new business, anything else you'd like to bring up tonight on old and new business? Peaky? I'm going to repeat what I talked about this afternoon. Um, uh, Bellingham participated in the Bellingham Energy Prize for three years under the Georgetown University Energy Prize umbrella. Uh, and I'm going to announce that Bellingham made it to the top 10 of the 50 cities. So this is really great news. And I just wanted to say that there are a lot of people who put in a lot of effort on this. And I'm really proud of our city. and. I hope we win. That's it. Okay. I won. April. So we have the demands from the group that did the camp out. And I know there are things that, Mayor, you've contemplated and the council's talked about. Yeah, great. So, well, one, I, I just, this is clearly something we've, we've known that we need to make a plan. We were looking at the low barrier shelter and hoping that that would move through sooner than later. So it's certainly maybe a committee item for us to discuss. And I think the community, some of these seem really simple, but when we talk about public health and safety and rules that we have, state, all those things, I think people just, we need education on what we can and can't do and what we'd like to prioritize. Anything else under old and new? I guess I would just mention that the, um, at our request, the county is convening a uh, homeless strategies work group. The first meeting of the homeless strategies work group is this Thursday. I will be attending along with, I believe, Councilor Hamill and Kelly, you'll be there as well. Um, Anything else under old and new? I'll now report out the executive session. There were three items in the executive session. Uh, the first one was potential of property acquisition. Um, I would entertain a motion from a council member to authorize the purchase of 17.5 acres of a watershed parcel for water quality protection, uh, purchasing the property from Richard W. Maxwell and Ann E. Maxwell and James Maxwell for $640,000 with anticipated closing date of January 10th, 2018 using watershed protection monies. Move approval. Move. Second. We have a motion and a second. I, okay. <laughs> I think Roxanne made the motion. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. The second was also a property acquisition discussion. Staff provided information on property acquisition. However, no action was taken. It was an information discussion only. The third item was a collective bargaining contract negotiations with the Watcom Guild. Um, we settle our uh, payments with bargaining units, unions that is. Uh, this one covers the Watcom Guild. Staff provided information on proposed collective bargaining agreement between the city and the guild. Um, I would entertain from a council member a motion to ratify the agreement with the following general terms. A mere half percent increase in take effective retroactively in July of 2017. A 4% increase to cover a two year period uh, taking effect on January of 2018 and a 2% increase on January 1st of 2019. The parties also agreed to convert an attendance bonus, which was always paid out instead to a simple wage increase of 1.75% to be effective on January 1st of 2018. Um, um, 
benefits. The employee's contribution towards health insurance premiums in 2017 will increase by 5% above the contribution rate in 2016, and the employer's contribution towards premiums in 2018 will increase by 5% from the contribution in 2017. The employer's contribution towards premiums in 2019 will increase by a further 5% from the contribution rate in 2018. With those terms, is there a motion? Move so approval. Moved. Second. Second. I believe Roxanne moved. <laughs> she knows how to make the motion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dan, Dan made the motion, I think. And I don't know who seconded. What? It's Borneman. Borneman seconded the motion. Is there any further discussion on the motion to approve the collective bargaining agreement? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, that ends the report of the executive session. We will now go on to the mayor's report. Mayor Kelly. Uh, first of all, thank you for your vote on the budget. I really appreciate it. I would have said something this afternoon, but I was busy talking to the, I don't know who I was talking to, <laughs> but I wasn't here. Um, so thank you very much. I really appreciate the way this uh, process has been going. Secondly, <clears throat> I looked at this list this morning that was coming from the advocates, and um, I think that there are opportunities in fact, I've already asked for looking for a location for parking. Um, there's a very timely article on the front of the Seattle Times today that talks about their navigation center, which is what we hope our low barrier shelter will be more like. So it's not just a shelter, but it's the support, the case management and the support for the people that are there. Um, and so I, we look forward to potentially bringing you back some recommendations on these, like easiest to hardest. And, um, and like I said, the parking one, we're already, we're looking for something right now, either um, someone volunteering to, to use their empty parking lot, which I've asked for a long time and haven't had any takers, um, or us to look for one of our lots that we're not using during the during the daytime or that we can designate some spaces for. So we'll bring back some recommendations for you on that. Um, I need your approval for a reappointment of Richard Davis III to the Civil Service Commission. Move approval. Okay. Motion before us to reappoint Richard Davis to the Civil Service Commission. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Richard is reappointed. And I have two more, or three more appointments just for your information. Alexis Blue is going to be reappointed, and Kelly Hall is going to be appointed to the Parks and Rec Advisory Board, and a reappointment of Elaine Wood to the Community Development Advisory Board. I have the pleasure of meeting for about 10 to 15 minutes with, with each of the new appointees to thank them for their volunteer service, to talk about expectations, um, and to invite them to their appreciation <laughs> event we have for them in the spring. So um, it gives me a chance to, what I like about it is it gives me a chance to personally thank many members of our community that volunteer their time to make our community a better place. Okay, thank you, Kelly. And uh, just some comments. Um, you did uh, convene a community solutions work group on homelessness, which included numerous people who work in social service agencies and homeless individuals themselves. We have been at work on this. We identified strategies and gaps in uh, housing services, and we're moving forward on that, including working with the county on implementing those. And I do know from a uh, coalition and homelessness meeting several months ago, that the idea of a safe storage program has actually been actively talked about. There actually is a private donor who's willing to donate those large storage boxes, but it needs to be retrofitted and made available in a safe way for homeless individuals to keep their stuff safe. So many things we heard tonight, I think that many of us are aware of those solutions. I'm not saying we've solved them yet or even done all we can uh, yet in our power, um, but these issues are, are not new and we appreciate them being brought forward to us. We now move on to the consent okay. Can I just okay. say one thing, Michael? Ooh, oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Got to move fast. I we'll, know. we'll come back to you, Kelly. Because I was, so uh, we have a motion to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Kelly. Okay, it's very un untimely right now, um, but the same presentation that we made at the um, the housing uh, community solutions work group on housing, we will will we will be proposing um, that to make that same presentation. In fact, we're gonna make that same presentation so that the county and the city have the same information that we've been able to generate from the 
group that we put together. Right. One of the things that's important for the community to, to realize is under state law, it's counties which are designated as the lead entity in addition homelessness because homelessness is seen as a regional issue. And so this is why we always turn to the county on these issues. Um, finally, we'll do something called confirmation ratification of an ordinance. Um, on November 6th, the City Council did what we call the first and second reading with the first passage of Ordinance 2017-11027, which is the ordinance relating to the levying of uh, property taxes and establishing the amount to be raised in 2018 on the assessed evaluation of property, real property within the city. On November 13th, the City Council did what we call the third or final reading of the unchanged ordinance, 2017-11027. And while the ordinance was not included in the agenda bill packet that was published in November 13th Council meeting, uh, it is the same ordinance that was published before. Council members were given copies of the ordinance and the clerk um, says read the ordinance into the record. I, I, not the entire ordinance, it was really the title of the ordinance was read into the record. Yeah, our council rules provide that the, the title of the ordinance, which is usually a, a fairly comprehensive description, is, is equivalent to reading the ordinance. It's not the entire ordinance. And Councilmember Murphy did indeed read that and give that description. Um, to put a final bow on it, I move the council to confirm and ratify Ordinance 2017-11-027. Second. Uh, we Motion were confirming to confirm and ratify justice here for Ordinance 2017-11-027. Is there any further discussion on the motion? <laughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> that ratification Confirm. goes ahead unanimously. There are no final readings of ordinances. Is there any further business before the Bellingham City Council? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned.